company. I'm going to be keeping your company for the next few hours. You are not going to believe the company. This company. You're going to bankrupt your mama's company. At least I have the radio to keep me company. On 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. There are so many reasons on a Monday for me to celebrate, for all of us collectively to celebrate, to exhale, to feel good, to be happy, to see spring hopes eternal. Let me just list for you, the members of this company, the reasons why we are celebrating on a Monday. Number one in no particular order. Eddie, before we came on the program, since we walked into the studio today, there has been not one really, but two. There have been two different stories or occasions for us to use one of our more well-played sounders on the program. We'll go in the order in which it happened. First off, Zaire Franklin, the dynamic linebacker and I think both on-field and to a great extent off-field leader of the Indianapolis Colts, agreeing to a contract extension, three years and a reported $31 million to keep Zaire Franklin in the mix and in the fold. And that buys a ton of hoagies from Hoagies and Hops, his favorite place as a Philly native. I still need to get out there. It's a good place. I've heard it's delicious. It is very big, good. Big cheesesteak guy, so I want to get out there at some point. Very good place. 42nd in Boulevard, I think. 46th in Boulevard. Oh, right by Butler, right? Correct. That seemingly would have been the big story of the day for the Colts, but then this in the last 45 minutes. No surprise whatsoever. Michael Pittman Jr. is locked in. He will continue to drive to work on West 56th Street for the next three years, knowing that he has in the bank roughly $46 million of guaranteed money. That's what it sounds like for him, baby. Well done. $70 million total over three years for Michael Pittman Jr. $46 million guaranteed. 109 catches, 1,152 yards a year ago. Those are the two big stories for the Colts. We also have reason to be optimistic about the Indiana Pacers. Wasn't it last week one day when we came in here and like literally everything had gone to hell in a handbasket? I mean, that's most weeks around here, but yes, it was last week. Yeah. (laughs) Isn't that the story of this show? Yes. Right? Yeah. Pacers winning uh, against Orlando, 111-97. Tyrese Halliburton, really strong game. Uh, Got good play from Obi Toppin as well. We'll talk about that over the course of today. Game back of the Magic now in the East. The How about that? They're going to end up in that play-in game, though, aren't they? Because you have, obviously, the news of Benedict Matherin. That hurts, for sure. Yeah. It's a killer because you look at where you wanted him to continue to progress in the final month-ish of his second year in the league and how valuable he was for that second unit. It's going to be tough. It also, not to make this fully a rainy open to the show, but it's part of the reason you could stomach the Buddy Heald trade because those minutes previously o- occupied by Buddy were for Benedict Matherin. And they were for others too, but he was the biggest beneficiary of that. So to now obviously have Buddy dealt to Philadelphia before the trade deadline and then no Benedict Matherin the rest of the year, you're going to need guys and one of the main ones you'll circle, a guy like Ben Shepard, to really step up and, and kind of play beyond their years down the stretch of this season like a month to play. Of course, you also have, from the college basketball standpoint, things to get excited about, right? Yeah, it's Championship week. Come it on now. championship week. You got Indiana on a streak now, right? Yeah, it's four. They jumped their way from 97th to 93rd in the net rankings. Don't sound excited there, Jimmy. Look, Mike Woodson is currently taking somewhat of a victory lap media-wise. If you saw his quote yesterday, he basically is emphatic that he's done enough now where his job shouldn't be in question. Maybe had this happened a month ago, yes. But the fact that it's happening now when they largely, barring a, I think they have to win it outright. I've not talked with bracketologists about it. I think they have to win the Big Ten tournament outright. 
Maybe there's an argument if they somehow turn this into like a seven game winning streak. Well, what they would have to do, Jimmy, is is get probably to the Big Ten title game, Correct. but beat at least two tournament bound teams Correct. to do it. Yes, because so, they just don't have quality wins. No, they right? don't. They have no quality wins on their resume, so that would have to happen. And look, yes, I went to Indiana. I I would love to be wrong on this, but more than likely. I'm not going to be wrong on this, and they're going to miss the tournament this year. And it's like, that's great that you won four games in a row when the season didn't matter anymore. Like, that that's awesome. You still have all the issues next year. And I know that it was reported that and said in their senior day speeches, Trey Galloway and Anthony Leal are coming back to Indiana next year. And that's great. But the bigger fears and worries are what happens with Malik Renew, what happens with McKenzie and Baco. And oh, by the way, there's no recruits in 2024, so you got to hit it hard in the transfer portal this offseason. There's all these big question marks and the idea that you win four games in a row when unless you make it seven games in a row, it's going to be when the basketball didn't matter doesn't ultimately make what was said about Mike Woodson and the struggles in February invalid. That's that's why I'm irritated today. Purdue on the other side of things, by the way, heading into Big Ten tournament play exactly the way that you would expect and want them to be. I, I think Purdue is in really good shape here, really good position. They just seem to be locked in. Are you right? in the same boat I am, though? My prognosis on Purdue, barring like you know them losing by 30 in the first game of the Big Ten tournament, my prognosis on Purdue does not change if they don't win the Big Ten tournament. Like My thought on them going into the NCAA tournament in a week from now has no impact on what happens in the Big Ten tournament. I've seen enough of them Purdue to not judge them that Purdue would have to get way. beat in the Big Ten tournament. Who do they open with? They have a bye, right? Uh, winner yeah, of I mean, it's be Minnesota and Michigan State. And even those two, by the eye test, you're like, okay, you know. Sparty's weird. They are. But one of those two teams would have to beat Purdue by 40. To knock yeah. them off the first seed line. Well, I and even, I don't even know that that would happen. I think at this point, Purdue's work is done. I meant just your pulse on them. Like, the seed line, that's a whole other conversation. For me, like, it's it's over. I know what they are. Now it's about, okay, yes, they'd love to add another Big Ten tournament title to their resume. But for me, now it's shifted towards, man, what a regular season. Near perfect regular season from Purdue. And now that next rung on the ladder is the journey to a Final Four. The journey to Phoenix. Yeah, I mean... Look, I think Purdue is just in a different psychological state than they than they have been in years past. I think they are locked in. Yeah, I do too. I'd be stunned if they don't go deep into the tournament. Yeah, I mean, stunned. at at minimum, it's a second weekend team for me, regardless of what the draw is. I think that's the bar for most people. There's reason to be optimistic and upbeat about the fact that, as you mentioned, championship week. Yes, and you've got it now coming to the Coliseum here for the Horizon League championships, which is cool, right? Yep. They're going to have stuff going on out at the fairgrounds starting today. Then you can go to the Coliseum. You can watch both the men's and women's for the championship to see which team gets in out of the Horizon League, which is very cool. So that's exciting. I'm telling you, there's excitement all around. I want to go. I think I might go. I've thought about oh, going to the final. It was, it's great. I'm telling you. that the Because I don't know that I've been since I was little to an event out at the Coliseum. It's great. I mean, it's, it's, no it's a great to place to watch a game. It's you know, the tickets are not outrageous. You got a great vantage point. And it is cool to know that, you know, you are watching two teams, one of which is going to go to, you got Cleveland State, Oakland, um, Milwaukee. Help me out on the fourth here. In terms of trying to get in out of that tournament. I've got to look right here. Um, but still. Northern I mean, Kentucky. Northern Kentucky, thank you. To know that, you know, one of those – they're, One, they're playing, seven, five, six, or your seeds left. Playing for the right to go to the big dance. Women's side as well, uh, taking place over at the Coliseum. Jake, by the way, just for you, weirdest thing that I bet on over the weekend. Uh, had some big sky tournament action yesterday. Idaho State uh, squeaked past, uh, pulled the upset, actually, over uh, Northern Colorado. It was a thrilling affair. Northern Colorado's had a good year, right? They did. They got bounced. They were the two seed in that tournament. They got bounced. Okay, now, question is this. If Northern Colorado... Does that help Indiana State? Because uh, if Northern Colorado had made it to – that's not – what level was that? Was that the finals, though? That was semifinal. Semifinal. Two seed. Okay. Yeah. So, because Northern Colorado has had a decent year. They have. And I think they were kind of an on-the-bubble team, were they not? So, if they get bounced anything other than the final, does that clear up space? Indiana State, 
I think Indiana stay 10. I think they are too. It's going to be razor thin. It is. But Lenardi posted this, and I posted it last night, gave credit where credit was due because he did the research, but he's usually pretty good on this. It doesn't mean anything in terms of finality, but he says that they, with a loss to Drake, would replace Villanova as his last four in. So by that logic, if you're an Indiana State fan or if you just want teams from the state of Indiana in the tournament, if that's your biggest thing right now, you want to be rooting against this entire week teams that were in the last four in. Now, he updated this because he updates it daily now during championship week. Indiana State is at the top of his last four in. So they're not the last team in. They are the top of that last four grouping. So you want to root against Virginia, Colorado, St. John's, Villanova, and New Mexico to name a few in there. But additionally, you want to root for favorites in conference tournaments. Because the last right, thing you want right. if you're Indiana State bid stealers. is bid stealers. Exactly. Right. That would play into the pipe dream of IU winning the Big Ten tournament for the first time. That would be catastrophic for you're Indiana right. State. You're right. That's a very good point. Now, I got the feeling yesterday, going into the Moval Championship, my thought was that Indiana State and Drake were playing Jimmy to see which of them was going to be the automatic and which one was going to be relegated to the play-in game. I think the, the I think winner, Drake had to win, my, personally. I think Drake had to win. I think Indiana State was be, the only that one that be. had that caveat. But, but I guess the better way of saying it, I think Indiana State losing yesterday mm -hmm. moved them from an 11 to a 12. Yeah, more than likely, yes. So, there, so Indiana State gets in. And then, you know, so let's say they, they get in like as a – and then they, like, stun fifth-seeded Clemson or San Diego State gets bounced because the trees are going to win. Indiana State will win their first NCAA tournament game. He has them, and by he, I mean Joe Lenardi. Again, for what this is worth, he's Unless not, they're going to play the play-in game, and then who knows, He has right? them as an 11 in a play-in game against Colorado. That's, again, that's all speculation, but Lenardi doesn't matter. I thought the 12s were playing. So it's two 11s and That's two right. 16s is how they do it. You have an 11 and a 16 play. Those are separate games. 11 versus 11, 16 versus 16 on Tuesday, and then an 11 versus 11, 16 versus 16 on Wednesday, and then the official tournament starts Thursday. But that's how that works. So I guess that's – so if they'd won yesterday, they'd have been a 12, but that's a locked in. Yeah. As, as opposed to an 11 Correct. that has to play in. Yeah, and, now, not, and not all – there are 11s that get in firmly, right? There's two 11s that get firmly locked in. There's also personal news that we are celebrating today. We are celebrating that Jimmy, not once but twice, had ingrown toenails shaved <laughs> out of his toes, right? Shout out to Dr. Sullivan in Westfield. He's an IU grad. So you went in with some foot pain, and they hoisted that bad boy in the air, they froze did. it, and dug right out of that big they toe, did. right? And the reason I'm chuckling about it is because I thought I was just going in for a consultation. And he was like, no, we can actually get this done for you today. And I was like, all right, so yes. How long, a, for how long a procedure are we talking? Uh, if you include the numbing, about 30 minutes. Did they give you an IV? No IV. So you're not wacky on the junk now? No wacky on the junk, okay. no. But uh, efficiently in and out in 12 minutes in terms of the actual operation. Really? Yeah. Okay. Now, big news for Eddie Garrison as well. By having an ingrown toenail dug out of your toes, Jimmy, that makes you an old man. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah, I'm officially old man territory. Ed Eddie just simply became a man over the course oh, of the week. Oh, yes. <laughs> Eddie has graduated to full adulthood. Eddie, would you like to let the audience know what it was that you did over the weekend that made me as proud of you as anybody that I've been proud of in a long time? I think you should share this, uh, this news. No, you should. I That's can't remember how you broke this news to me. But I was in St. Petersburg over the weekend for the IndyCar race. And I was, I landed on Friday night. I met up with Michael Young and Rick Evans from the radio network and had dinner. And then was driving to the hotel. I believe, I, I'm fairly certain it was, was it Friday night or Saturday night? It was Friday, Friday night, night, right? Friday night. And Eddie sends me a screen grab of Jeff Spicoli, and I'm like, wait, are you watching Fast Times? And he says, for the very first time, I'm watching Fast Times at Ridgemont High. 
And I, I go, dude, like you have to send me, where are you right now in the movie? And he said he was in the car crash scene. And I said, well, pause it right now. So he paused it. I called him on the phone. Now, Eddie, you were impressed a little bit, weren't you? Or were you mortified? Um, I was concerned. Is this your favorite party bit. trick, by the way? <laughs> to be able to quote the entire movie from no, forward to back? Movie, here's my movie, favorite party yes. trick. Let me tell you my favorite party trick. Yesterday, I got on the plane last night to come home from t- from St. Pete. I sit down next to a younger couple. And I basically said, okay, before we take off, let me just say, I mean, we were like, chatting it wasn't like i broke the ice with this right and and because people are like dude you were so weird they, trust me they like they had fun with it. it was and this was before we took as soon as we got airborne you know we I, i'm not one of those that sits there and talks to people but while we were like getting situated waiting for people to board because we were towards the front of the plane that's after you finished taking selfies with all your fans right that's, that's right I mean, and that's, then no, it's an inconvenience for you counting but. around how many people around me have their shoes off <laughs> so the couple next to me i just said okay well here's what i'm going to guess they were probably in their mid-20s i said so let me just guess right now. You guys have been dating for three and a half years, and you met not necessarily through mutual friends, but because like mutual friends didn't set you up, but you had the same circle of friends, so you met at a party approximately three and a half years ago, and you've been dating ever since. And like literally both of them were like, dude, that's the freakiest thing I've ever heard. They looked for the air marshal right and away. Then, totally. They're like, how in the world do you know that? And then the girl, I said, well, you're a teacher. And I looked at the guy, and I said, and you work from home, but I want to say in marketing. And he's like, uh, she's a seventh grade teacher. And That's I work, wild. I work from home as a financial consultant. Are you secretly okay. a mentalist? Did we not know this about you? You could just, there are certain dead giveaways about okay. people. All right. But at any rate, my other, the only other skill I have in life is Eddie. I called Eddie right then and then basically went verbatim for the movie as he was. Like, I'm like, I can tell you right now exactly every line. And I was, Eddie, I was dead on, right? You were, yeah. How long did this phone call go? This is just like a scene, right? This oh, was, um, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he called me when I was about 45 minutes into the movie, and I think our uh, conversation on the phone lasted about 10. All right. And then he dropped a whole bunch of trivia that my parents were impressed with. Yeah, see? Well, yeah, I talked about how I'd been to the filming sites and everything else. So in honor of Eddie finally breaking down and seeing Fast Times at Bridgemont High, we are going to, not necessarily next when Don Fisher joins, because that has its own self-contained intro, but... Uh, we're going to play music from Fast Times of Ridgemont High as bounce back music for the majority of the show today. That's what we're going to do today, just for fun. Um, big show lined up, though. Obviously, the Colts will be a major topic of discussion with Michael Pittman Jr. and Zaire Franklin in the mix. We know that for at least three years. Do anticipate, by the way, that hopefully this week, by the next couple of days, that we will have Michael Pittman Jr. on the show. That That is, I understand that things can change, but that hopefully is the game plan right now that Michael Pittman Jr. will join us and we'll talk about this process. Also, the other big question that I have is, do the Colts make a phone call? Do the Colts get on the phone and make a phone call to Cincinnati? Mm. I would say unlikely because of the price tag of it. I think you I think you make the call though, right? Absolutely You're make doing the call. Your due diligence. But are T. Higgins and Michael Pittman Jr. too similar? I don't think so. I mean, I, that that's the dream signing that a lot of people, myself included, were talking about before the Bengals tagged him. The idea of him going to the open market, and he is a high-level two, borderline one, because he's on Jamar, because he's with Jamar Chase, right? Chase takes up so much of that offense. But my point being, both of them are kind of like really good, not necessarily yard after the catch, I hate to say possession type receivers sure. and do you do both of them need in other words does does Michael Pittman Jr. need because I think the Colts could use another receiver I like Josh Downs a lot and Alec Pierce we have yet to see if Alec Pierce Pierce should be your fourth or fifth option it's okay that he's not going to be the player he was drafted to be he's still valuable well but- the question is this and I think Jimmy you might have been the one that raised this originally the the question is, is Alec Pierce the player that he was drafted to be, but he has yet to play with the quarterback that it was expected he'd be playing with? I think that's a fair statement. We've discussed this in the past. I think that it's fair for each wide out, tight end, any name you want to throw out there position-wise in the last three years. I think that's fair. That said, 
based on situational football with Pierce outside of a consistent deep arm, and that's fair. Maybe it suddenly unlocks part of his game that we've not gotten a chance to see yet. But I would say on the whole, the idea of him suddenly becoming the second-round pick that he was drafted to be is unlikely. Point being for Pittman, not unlike T. Higgins, to really, I think, take accentuation off of their talent and complement their talent, you need stretch, open space receivers kind of getting behind them, if you will. And I do kind of feel like Pittman, and don't get me wrong, having a wide receiver core of Michael Pittman Jr. and T. Higgins would be unbelievable, well, right? If solely but, what you want is behind the defense, and Eddie and I have gone back and forth with him kind of being against this, I don't want to speak for him incorrectly, but like, then you go get Calvin Ridley. Like, that's what you go do. You go get a true deep threat if that's right. what you're looking for. Well, that's what, that's what like, in other words, if you're going to spend T. Higgins, here's the point. T. Higgins is apparently requested a trade in Cincinnati. He is tagged by the Bengals right now at $21.8 million this year. He wants a longer term deal and is unhappy that it has not progressed to the point or even to the overture that he likes. One would assume that T. Higgins is looking for money in the same area that Michael Pittman just received. Michael Pittman got basically 23.3 a year for the next three years. So $2 million more per year than, than the tag is going to give T. Higgins. The point being, are T. Higgins and Michael Pittman Jr., while they are both dynamic, if you're going to pay that kind of money to go offset Michael Pittman Jr., do you do it by getting a receiver that brings a different wrinkle to it than Higgins, who brings a lot of what Pittman Jr. brings to the table? I think that Higgins is different enough as a wide receiver to where it's okay. Like, I think that you can, you can ask him to do some of those same things, not identical, but some of those same things you would have asked Alec Pierce or a Calvin Ridley if you were to go after him. I think a lot of that has been master hidden in the mouths that Cincinnati had to feed. Here would be the hesitation I would have with T. Higgins. Okay. T. Higgins, and believe me, I mean, I saw T. Higgins virtually every snap he took in college, sure. and then obviously a majority of them for the Bengals. T. Higgins is an unbelievable receiver. He, it's interesting because he is a guy that Deion Kane was like this that the Colts took out of Clemson makes every impossible catch, but the drops are the ones right between the numbers. But T Higgins has ridiculous body control. He has hands like catcher's mitts that will catch anything. And he is an excellent route runner and a good size receiver, but he does not have breakaway speed and he doesn't have burst off the line speed, which is fine in his early to mid 20s. But you start you pay him where all of a sudden as soon as that line now you could make the argument that it's his route running that has allowed him to maybe extend his career. Reggie Wayne for example, once the speed went away was able to play another 3 years cuz he was such an excellent route runner. But if you look at Reggie Wayne the last year for example, you know, I'll never forget doing a radio show with Reggie Wayne, and he had a play where he got run down from behind on a long touchdown play. And he said, I kept running, and the end zone just kept moving further and further away from me. And with a T. Higgins, he is going to be a very good possession receiver long after the speed goes away, what speed he has goes away. But are you paying for – yard after catch guy for a guy that actually is just simply a really strong possession receiver because he has great hands and he can run great routes to get himself open but wherever you hit him is likely where the play ends right and I think that for him may be coming at an earlier time than it is for other receivers because the speed wasn't necessarily break away there to begin with. The only but. issue I have with it of, of of acquiring him is the fact that you have to trade for him now because of what the tag does. Right. I would have liked it and stomached it better had it just been open market, here's a bunch Fair. of money. Fair.
Um, and, you know, maybe now you, you, you shave a million off of what it would have paid to get him in an open market because he's trying to get out of the tag. But, yes, to your point, you're having to give up assets now, right, which is totally different. Uh, Indiana, by the way, win streak. Big Ten tournament next. Don Fisher had said, you know, crazy things could happen if they make a run. Has the run begun? We'll talk about that next. You've heard about the thousands of patients.
how it sounded. Don Fisher on the call for the Hoosiers win to move to 18 and 13. Finishing the Big Ten regular season at the 500 mark at 10 and 10 as they won in Assembly Hall yesterday. And Don, we decided to play that because, look, the reality is this. It hasn't always been fun to relive IU basketball over the course of the year. But you know what? In the time when you want to see things starting to turn around, here we are on a four-game skid, and I guess going in, you had said, hey, you never know. You try to make a run. I know they haven't played the front end of the Big Ten in this four-game streak, but Don, reality is it looks like they are starting to play a different brand of basketball than they were a month ago, correct? Yeah, they're definitely playing better. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Obviously, they'd lost 9 of 11, I think it was, in four in a row before the streak began. And they won four straight, and they've looked better doing it. They've shot the ball better doing it. I, I went into yesterday's game. Uh, the three wins that they had prior to yesterday, they had shot 57% from the field, 47% from the three-point line, and they were knocking in 74% of their free throws. A little bit of that went away yesterday, especially with the free throw shooting. But at the same time, they are just they're playing so much better offensively but really the story is defense that the defense and I'm not saying they play consistently well throughout ball games but uh, there are times when they just shut other teams down which is really nice to see to say the least and this is a ball club right now that's uh, very high in confidence which they were not during that period where they were struggling Uh, and they've gotten their confidence back they're shooting the ball better like I just said and their defense is definitely more intense than what we've seen Uh, over the year on a consistent basis Dom one of the things that Mike Woodson has been adamant about and and, you know there are a lot of things that Mike Woodson has said in the last week or so that that Jimmy and I can get to later but you know one of the things I think with you uh, on on your weekly shows and that with the media that he has talked about is that Indiana has the potential to be a totally different team when Xavier Johnson is playing for them at the level that Mike Woodson believes he can consistently do can you talk a little bit about the the ways in which the things in which Johnson can help them, the areas where he improves them when he is, I guess, on being good Xavier, so to speak? Yeah, well, there's there's been good and the bad. <laughs> You're not wrong there, but but the truth of the matter is, when he's on the floor, I think he mostly affects defensive play for Indiana because he gives you a guy that is tenacious, he's aggressive, he's tough. Uh, he does the things that you need a defensive player to do. And I help. I think he helps Indiana in that regard more than anything else. I'm not saying that he's not a decent offensive player. He is. But he has struggled with turnovers this year uh, pretty dramatically compared to the previous couple of seasons. And, you know, he wasn't bad the first 11 games last year. When he, after he got hurt, of course, he didn't play again. And the year before that, the last 10 games of the season, he was really good. Uh, he was doing exactly what Mike, Mike Woodson wanted him to do. And and Xavier, when he does what Coach Woodson's asking of him, uh, he usually plays his best basketball. When he gets a little carried away, tries to do too much is when he gets himself in trouble. But if there's one area that he's really helped this team since he's come back from the injury has been the defensive end of the floor. Voice of the Hoosiers, the Hall of Famer, Don Fisher, is our guest. Don, is there anything over this win streak that you can point to that has helped them kind of unlock outside shooting at a much more efficient and even more consistently taking them than they did at any point in the season? Well, probably the guy that stepped up in that vein more than anybody is McKenzie Mako because uh, he's knocking down, I think he's getting three and four uh, three-point field goals to drop in every ball game in this uh, four-game winning streak. He he started to play his best basketball. He's still not a great defensive player by any stretch, but at the same time, his offensive play has picked up. He's become more aggressive with his shooting. He, He definitely doesn't just settle for threes or long outside shots. He tries to get inside. He gets to the rim. He's a very physically strong kid uh, at 6'8", and rangy on top of that. Uh, So he can do some things offensively that help you, and I think he's probably been the one guy that stepped up more so than anybody at this point, with the exception of Khalil Ware. And, of course, Ware is at a different level right now than what he was playing at early in the season. He is playing tremendous basketball. Uh, He's got 14 double-doubles now. I think he's had a double-double in three of the four games 
that we've just won, uh, that Indiana has just won. And the one game that he didn't, he was one point off of getting a double-double. He had 15 rebounds in that game. So uh, those two guys uh, have really picked up their play here toward the end of the season, which has helped immensely. Don, has Indiana done things schematically different over the last, let's say, you know, four to six games to kind of awaken those guys, or was it really just kind of a personnel thing? Well, I I can't say that they've changed their their. I, the one thing I will say, and, and Eric Sewer, my color analyst, has talked about this quite a bit here of late, is he likes when Indiana pushes the ball, when they are more aggressive offensively, when they just get out there and and try to move the ball around the perimeter and that kind of thing, they are nowhere near as effective when they try to get the ball inside or drive to the rim. And that's why Trey Galloway has been so special here in this last last stage of the season as well. Uh, They're getting the ball into his hands for drives to the rim. Uh, He knocked down a three yesterday along with a two and then got hurt, didn't come back the rest of the ball game, only played seven minutes. But when he's not in the ball game, it, it, it does affect the offense. And Indiana was on a roll at the early part of the game when he was playing. Uh, and they got that 17-point lead in the first half uh, with, I think, eight minutes and 50 seconds to go in the first half. They were on a roll there. And their defense was a big part of that, too, because they were so aggressive at the defensive end. So I can't really say it's schematics or anything like that. I think maybe just playing harder at this point in the season uh, which is what you have to do, especially if you're going to get out of a slump that, like they were in. That That's a big significant factor, especially defensively. And then, again, the outside shooting and the rest of the shooting and, and from free throw line and every place else has gotten better. Don, I know this is outside of the sphere of this season, but with the senior day speeches and the outlook and all the questions about this roster next year, what does it do to ease the burden of the off season? having Trey Galloway and Anthony Leal coming back next year? Well, it's huge because you want to have a couple of guys on your ball club that has been been around the block, have done things that have helped this ball club, at the same time, leadership skills, uh, the the knowing what the, how this coach wants you to play, knowing your role, those kinds of things, the little things that people don't think all that much about. But obviously when you've got – uh, a player like uh, Anthony and, and Trey Galloway. Galloway, of course, playing a lot of minutes through the three years that Mike Woodson has been here. Leo, not so much until this season when they've really given him an opportunity and he's had an opportunity to, to show himself. Those two guys have been around the program a long time. They both understand what Woodson's asking of them. They know their roles, uh, and they can preach that to the other guys that will be on the, on the roster next year because – It's going to be a different roster. There's no question about that. You've got no incoming freshman now. You've got a kid named Ja'Kai Newton who hasn't played a lick this year, who hopefully will be ready. He hasn't really played much basketball the last two seasons because of some severe knee issues and some surgeries that he went through. And he's supposed to be a talent. He certainly looks the part. He looks like a safety in the NFL at 6'3 and and about 200 pounds and just looks strong as an ox. But obviously he's had problems with his legs. And he hasn't played a lot of basketball. So he's even though he's been here a year, uh, he hasn't really been out on the floor and given anybody a chance to see what he's capable of. But they're going to have to go to the transfer portal. Let's face it, they're going to have to go to the portal. We don't know who's going to leave, if anybody's going to go in the portal. Obviously, Leal and, and, and getting Trey Galloway back, huge leadership aspects for this ball club. Don, when you look, Don Fisher, the voice of the Hoosiers, is our guest. Big Ten tournament getting set to get underway in Minneapolis. Indiana will play the winner of Michigan and Penn State uh, as the Hoosiers play their way into now a bye as the sixth seed. I I, I know it's dangerous to look ahead, Don, but if we're going to do that, let's say they win that game and then they're able to get past Nebraska. They would have Illinois, Iowa, or Ohio State. Let's say for the sake of argument, Illinois. I guess it's dangerous to look ahead, but my, my question would be this. I feel like in the Big Ten tournament, they would probably need – I think they're clearly on the outside looking in for the NCAA tournament. But I feel like two wins over quality tournament-bound teams late in the year might be enough to kind of make a final oomph for them. Am I being overly optimistic, or do they need to flat win the tournament outright to get in? Uh, they've got to get at least to the championship game, in my opinion, 
And if they get to the championship, they better show something special in that contest, whoever it's against. Uh, obviously, uh, if Indiana would win this first ball game uh, in this Big Ten tournament, they obviously have a, a team, if Penn State wins over Michigan, a team that's beaten them twice already. Then they would have Nebraska, a team that's beaten them twice already. <laughs> and then, of course, you get to the semifinal. And they played Illinois tough. If Illinois gets there, uh, they beat Ohio State twice if they get there, although Ohio State's under a new coach now. And if Iowa would get there, they beat Iowa. So they are capable of winning all the way to the championship, but they've got to get through these. They got to get through the first game first. Let's let's take, let's not go ahead of ourselves. And I know you guys are trying to take that all hypothetical, but at this point, Indiana can't be looking any farther ahead than Penn State, who's beaten twice already. And if it's Penn State, or it's not Penn State, it's a Michigan team that has really struggled this year, and you'd be surprised by like crazy if they didn't beat Michigan. So right now, we're just worried about Penn State. Here's my crazy conspiracy theory, Don. I have a lot of them, but this is one of them. I've always felt like the Big Ten championship game, if you make it there, it's advantage both teams because by then the select, you know, that goes right up against the announcements for the selection committee. And and I like to think that they handle the Big Ten championship game the way I did my last final in college where you're like, you know what? I've done everything to now. I'm just, both are in. Great. We're not even going to analyze because the game happens so late that it's hard for them to factor it in. So if you get to the championship game, you're you're good to go at that point. And and what happens in that game is irrelevant. That's my conspiracy theory, Don. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> so Indiana gets to the championship game. They're in, baby. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, uh, Jake, but you got to understand one thing. Indiana's played in one Big Ten tournament championship game. It's crazy, I know. Back in 2001 against the Iowa Hawkeyes. And Indiana has gotten beat. In the 26 seasons preceding this event this year, Indiana has been beaten in the first play, first game that they played in 14 times. Did you I, know that? I, well, I knew the the Luke Recker shot was the one. Didn't Luke Recker hit a shot that beat them in the finals in 2001? That's correct. I mean, it, it is it is amazing for a program that obviously was so dominant in the Big Ten, leading into the Big Ten tournament, you know, that when that was created, and then it's like, holy cow, anemic. But I wanted to ask you this about the Big Ten tournament, and granted, Don, I hate to say this, a lot of years you're not there very long to see a lot of games of it, but <laughs> but, but that said, um, what, what group of fans in the Big Ten, th this kind of stuff I always find interesting. Give me a group of fans in the Big Ten that just travel well and regardless of where the Big Ten tournament is and regardless of their record. And I don't mean like the Indianas or Purdue's that are going to have good teams a lot, but just where it's like, you know what, they seem to have a group of fans that are supportive of their program even if they don't necessarily always have a shot to make a deep run in the Big Ten tournament. Oh, that's a hard one to answer um, because I'm not there long enough right. in most yeah. cases to see in, in terms of the fans in the first round, Don, that seem to be there <laughs> when you see them, yeah. Well, you you got to understand. You got to understand. I'm paying. I'm not really paying attention to the fans all that much when I'm there because I'm working. Well, and I'm not. Really, I guess I should I mean, say what <laughs> what fans are willing to take your hotel room when you've got to check out on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Uh, I, I mean, I think Michigan State fans are pretty good. Uh, they they'll travel from East Lansing to Chicago when we play up there, and if they're in, uh, if they're playing up their best, they always show up for the most part. Uh, but but Purdue fans have been really good too in that regard. So I you know I I can't actually. I'll be honest with you, Jake. Once Indiana's out of the tournament, I pay very little attention. No, I get uh, it. Other than the fact I watch the results and I do watch the championship game and all that kind of thing. But at that point, I'm ready to take a, a, a trip to the golf course. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> now, it's going to be tough to do in Minneapolis. It's probably a little chilly, but, you know, you can, you're can you back in Indiana. Hopefully, you'll be there for a while there, Don. Hopefully, you'll be there for a couple of days, right? I hope so, too. I, I will, hope we're there for a couple of days. But obviously, this team has had a nice run here at the end of the year, kind of salves a little of the wounds that Indiana – or the Hoosier Nation fans are feeling at this point. Uh, it's been a little bit of a controversial season in that regard, but nevertheless, uh, it's just good to be in the tournament. 
and to have a chance to do something special here at the end of the season. Yeah, just to find some stability and you know, just kind of get everybody back on the same page, right, Don? I mean, I think for the exactly. health of the program, there there are some obstacles for sure moving forward, but in terms of the conclusion of this year, to get everybody kind of cope aesthetic would certainly be a good thing. Don, we yep, appreciate absolutely. it. Enjoy enjoy Minneapolis, and if you do have free time, I hear that Paisley Park where Prince lived is pretty cool. There you go. <laughs> Hopefully no free time, though, right? I hope not. We're hoping to to watch a lot of basketball rather than doing anything else. <laughs> That's right. Don, appreciate it as always. You bet. Thanks for All having right. me. Don Fisher, the voice of the Indiana Hoosiers. Hoosiers getting underway, taking on the winner of Michigan. Boy, Michigan. I mean, what has happened with the Wolverines, right? And and I think Phil Martelli, I, I like Juwan Howard. When he first got there, you thought, wow, you know, it looks like Michigan really hit on something here. I think Phil Martelli's a really good coach. He was a longtime St. Joe's coach that's on their bench, but – um, just one of those years that gets away from you, and then you got to figure there's going to be some big changes in Ann Arbor. Do you as think well. they're having the same conversations about, hey, let's just win one? Let's win one and see what happens. <laughs> Go shock the world. Do you think that's yeah. happening over Ann Arbor? No, actually, what they're saying is let's just win one, but then we got the buzzsaw of Indiana, right? <laughs> we yes. go up against the yeah. red hot fighting Hoosiers. I, I don't know. How much does the whole, hey, job security safe? If you lose to Penn State a third time, how much does that get undercut if that happens? I'm just, I'm just asking. I don't know. You got to think they've already like, they're already on LinkedIn, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't would, you know? I, I didn't mean Michigan. Oh, uh, okay. I was gonna say, yeah. I, well, Michigan, I, Michigan's got to be looking. Yeah, right? no. I, I thought mean, that's I would, what you meant. Uh, no, like, no. Yeah. I meant, I meant uh, assuming Penn State takes care of Michigan and then it's Michigan Indiana. That's a little tongue in cheek, but you mean it's Penn State and Indiana, right? Penn State Indiana. Yeah, well, yeah. After Penn State, Michigan, it's then Penn State Indiana. What happens then with all the momentum if you lose to Penn State for a third time in the Boy, same season? You're not kidding there either, right? With a new coach and they lost their best player for one of those games, ugly. But it's not ugly what happened on West 56th Street. We'll get you cut back up, get you caught back up. And then again, the big news of the day over the weekend: Eddie Garrison finally broke through and saw Fast Times. So music from the movie all day long. It's a Monday. It's a good Monday. It's Quarry and Company on the fan. Hey, it's JMV, and this is your last chance for the dis-
tell you that in Sherman Oaks, California, I have been to the point, which is where Ron Johnson, stereo salesman, and of course, Stacey Hamilton had their date, so to speak. What percentage of movies that you have seen or TV shows would you say, just a random number off the top of your head, that you've actually been to where they've been filmed? Oh, I mean, in totality. Or movie, maybe not like, every movie you've seen, movies you love or shows you love. 20. Okay. A lot. I mean, I've been to L.A. enough times that, you know, most of them are filmed in L.A., right? Um, what we're, we're honoring Eddie's debut viewing of Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Five-star scale, Eddie, you give it? I'd give it a four and a half, five-star, yeah. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, good movie. Uh, let me tell you something that happened real quick before we get to, and there's still a lot to talk about over the course of today. Uh, Joel A. Erickson going to join us top of the hour with the big Colts news. Michael Pittman Jr. is Ira Franklin inking new deals with the Colts. We'll get into that, what it means, and where they go uh, elsewhere. But real quick, this is never – this is not by any stretch of the imagination, you know, something that is uh, unfortunately, you know, totally uncommon. But I don't know that it's ever happened for me. On Friday when I left here to go – and fly to St. Petersburg for the IndyCar race. Joseph Newgarden got the win, by the way. I get to the airport, and I can't remember the exact time that we were scheduled to leave, but we were, like, delayed in boarding, and it was like, what is taking so long? I mean, the the plane has pulled up, and yet no one's getting off of it. Like, what is taking so long? And all of a sudden, everybody started moving towards the window, and I thought, what is going on? And they hearse comes beside the plane, stopped probably 100 yards from the plane, and then a casket draped in the American flag comes off the cargo area of the plane, escorted by members of the military, and then a family came walking out next to the hearse, and they did a full, like, military procedure or service or or honor right there at the Indianapolis International Airport next to the plane. Wow. And literally everyone, people started figuring out what was going on. And everyone was kind of at the window watching all of this. It was kind of rainy too, so then you felt bad above the obvious reasons for the family. But the, and I don't know. I, I honestly do not know. I wish I, I guess I wish I'd known not only for curiosity, but out of the respect and honor of it. I don't know if this was someone who was a serviceman or woman who lived elsewhere and was simply being returned home, or if it was someone that was killed in in action. I don't know the protocol for that, but there was a full, when I say full, I mean it was probably 10 minutes long procession that took place from the plane into the hearse with the family and the military there and salute and then the the flag and everything else. And everyone was watching it. No one said anything. We were probably 25 to 30 minutes late boarding the plane and getting in the air. And it's the only time I've ever been on a flight where that happened where not a single person complained about it. Not one person said anything about the fact we were delayed. It was a pretty pretty moving thing for sure. Did it restore your faith in humanity? It, it did. I mean, well, it it's one of those things that you not realize the, not the uh, not the act. I'm obviously just joking about the passengers. To be clarify that. Yeah, no, for sure, and and it also makes you realize, you know, the fortune you have to live here because that is the kind of thing and the yeah. kind of dignity that goes with that process that does not take place in a lot of places, yeah. obviously. But yes, the fact that other it made you feel good about your fellow passengers that that everybody seemed to be respectful and understanding and aware of the minor inconvenience on our behalf for the ultimate sacrifice from someone else's joel a erickson joins us talk about the colts next what's wrong with rick he's kind of
by this. This is another great song. This is when uh, Brad's showing up for school, right? Just a few more payments in this cruising vessel's all his. Um, WTHR just sent this headline. A seven-year-old boy was found inside an Ohio Target store this morning when an employee was working to open the store. I mean, thankfully, the child's okay. So I, I click on the article. And the headline, 12-year-old boy spends night alone in Ohio Target. He gained five years in one night. I guess you would if you were by yourself at that age, right? I mean, stress levels. The fact he's 12, though, is significantly different than a 7-year-old, right? You get a little more wherewithal about you. Can you imagine? It's like home alone in Target. (laughs) I was going to say, can you imagine the amount of gummy (laughs) What you do the entire night? Well, I ate nine pounds of gummy bears. Had 17 <laughs> Diet Mountain Dews, and that popcorn was a little stale, but it was awesome. Uh, get your popcorn ready for Zaire Franklin, Michael Pittman Jr. It appears they're going to be at least three years remaining with the Indianapolis Colts. Joining us now to talk about that from the Indianapolis Star is Joel A. Erickson. And Joel, uh, begin with this. The, uh, the legal tampering, which I think is an oxymoron, the legal tamp- tampering period is about to open up here. Colts clearly wanted to make sure Michael Pittman Jr. did not even get that opportunity. Uh, by your understanding, is this deal like signed and delivered, or they simply have come to an agreement? Where do we stand right now? Uh, I believe, I think we're still in the agree to terms stage, but it's pretty much, but it's done. I mean, it's not, it's not going anywhere else. You know, this isn't. Um, I think if people always bring up Frank Gore supposedly signing with the Eagles and ending up with the Colts that one year, but this. This, my understanding is that this is this is agreed to. It's done. Michael Pittman Jr. is is a Colt for three years and seventy million and forty six of that guaranteed. Joel, is that about where you expected it would be if they were to come to a negotiation around that type of length and I, about that dollar amount? I, it's a little shorter than I thought. It's a little shorter than I thought, which kind of works out. It can work out for both the team and uh, Pittman. Um, you know, I, my first thought was three years. That puts it within the range of Anthony Richardson's rookie deal. So if he does turn out to be a great quarterback, then you have a better sense of what you're going to have to spend down the line um, from the Colts side. From, from Pittman's side, I think he'll be 29 when this deal is up. So if he plays out the full deal, uh, you'll end up with a chance to go to free agency and get a third contract, which is something that not a lot of people get to do. Um, so it, it, it kind of works for both both sides of it. Um. Yeah, especially with the way the receiver market has been has been going up. If he if he plays well enough, he, especially if you look at like Mike Evans just signed that that deal, he would be two years younger going to his third contract. So it can work out for Pittman just as much as it can work out for the Colts. Joel, it's time for Jake's dumb question of the day. Yep. And I usually have like five of them, so be honored that you get the first one right. <laughs> um, Michael Pittman Jr. had been franchise tagged. He has now agreed to a three-year deal with the Colts for $70 million or close to it, thereabout, whatever, 46 guaranteed. Does that take away the franchise tag, or does that come in addition to the franchise tag, thus he is locked in for four years instead of three? The franchise tag disappears. There is no franchise tag. Right, okay. So it's... It's three years. Yep. Now, they cannot use the fran- – the franchise tag window has closed, right? They cannot say, hey, you know what? Since we used it on Pittman and then we signed him, we're now going to turn around and franchise tag blank, right? Correct. Correct. Because because the because the window has passed. And also, I think – I have to I have to look at this. I think you can only use it one time per period. Because I think that's why teams often wait until the last – uh, minute to do that just in case they have another free agent that they want to tag um, as opposed to like you know the Chiefs did it with Legereus Need early um, I think in part because they want to trade him and they're trying to sort of send that message out there so yeah I, you can only use it one time but now it's gone for the Colts they have used it their streak is over but it lasted all of about you know what less than a week six days five days something like that where in terms of off-season priorities now do things still shift for the Colts? Obviously, still many bodies that are worthy of extensions or that could hit the open market with legal tampering close to being upon us. Grover Stewart headlining that list along with Kenny Moore. But where does their attention now shift? 
trying to retain more in-house guys or focusing on the next objectives in free agency to bring in outside talent? I'm going to, I'm going to sort of shift that question a little bit and say like the answer for me is the secondary Um, Grover Stewart's very important. We saw how bad the run defense was without him, but I think, you know, just in terms of you think about what's actually on the roster right now, because as of right now, Kenny Moore and Julian Blackman are free agents. And that means you have essentially just a bunch of young guys, young unproven guys back there on your roster right now. If you were to lose more Blackman, um, you're in a, in a pretty rough spot. Uh, especially considering the secondary was, was one of the big reasons that they felt like they should, that they couldn't make some calls last year. So Whatever they're going to do, if it's bringing back more, if it's bringing back Blackman, if it's adding somebody, if it's trading for Legereus Sneed, all that stuff, it's it's got to be the secondary. You you have to make moves in the secondary. Uh, I would say on top of even if you're going to bring back more in Blackman, but you have to at the very least do that to uh, to give this defense a chance next year. Yeah, I thought the the initial reaction, Joel, is going to be. Hey, wait a minute, and I get this, but I want you to kind of expand on Chris Ballard's strategy, if you will, or what he has been outspoken about as his strategy. It would be easy to look at this and say, why are the Colts going and, like, extending Zaire Franklin when there are free agents out there to be had? Why are they, you know, Pittman we knew was a priority, but are they trying to secure down or lock down their in-house to see what they then have to spend elsewhere? What is the precedent in the history of Chris Ballard's explanation of strategy here? Yeah, well, he number one, he's, he said his number one priority is always to bring back their own. Franklin fits into that. But also, also it's, it's what you just said. It's once you know, if, if you have guys that you want to have back, and you, you believe you want them to be around for a little while, the Colts, I know, don't necessarily look at – the Colts do not look at the cap as this year. Um, there are teams that do look at the cap that way, and then they figure – basically figure we'll figure out the rest later when we get to the next year. The Colts are not that type of team. They're, they're looking down the line. By, by re-signing Franklin now, um, not only is it, is it an example, another example of, of re-signing your own, um, which they have generally done. It sort of came into question with the whole Jonathan Taylor's nonsense last year, but uh, which they have generally done. It, it 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 goes to that, but it also goes to it allows them to plan. And we we don't have the full details on Franklin and Pittman. Pitt, Franklin's was reported as an extension. My my understanding is as extensions that might not affect this year. But depending on how Pittman's deal is structured and how Franklin's deal is structured, you could actually in theory, present more cap space than you than people would necessarily think based on the numbers that have been reported so far. So the, with every deal that comes in, the picture gets clearer for the Colts on what they could do. Joel A. Erickson is our guest, covers the Colts for the Indy Star. Joel, I'm with you. I think secondary has to be near the top of their list. I usually go offense first, but it's clear when you look at the roster, whether it's internally or externally, that needs to be done. What do you think is more likely to happen for the Colts, though? Because you brought up Legereus Sneed as an option the Chiefs want to trade, and there's no doubt he was one of the best cornerbacks in football last year. I think he would fit in very nicely underneath Gus Bradley. What's more likely for the Colts upcoming in these next couple of days? Being a team that's in on Legereus Sneed, trying to acquire him and sign him long-term, or taking care of one of their own, like a Julian Blackman or a Kenny Moore? I think it's. I mean, I, I think it's more likely. It's always more likely with the Colts that they take care of their own. Uh, I, I've been told that the Colts are still in play for Legereus Need. I here. This is the hard part of this week. If you're if you're trying to figure out what is trying to figure out what exactly in play means. Um, this is like the sort of question that Jake would would usually follow up with. It's the right you. question because because like someone tells you that they're in play. I, I don't know. Does that mean that they're front runners? Does that mean that they asked about him at the beginning? Does that mean that they're interested, but only if the price is right? Like all of that stuff is, and like you, if if people are following me on on social media sites and stuff, they'll notice that I don't necessarily do a ton of um, like the Colts are interested in this, and it's because I don't know what that means. Um, a lot of times, like I've, I've been told in the past that the Colts are interested in somebody. And then I find out later 
that what that meant was that they asked about them at a certain price point, and then the player signed for three times that elsewhere. Well, like, interested is really carrying a lot of weight there in something that maybe they're not, you right. know? I, I'm interested in a Rolex for 500 bucks, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, like, it's exactly like that. Like, that stuff is really hard to read um, in terms of what, what that means. So, for whatever it's worth, I was told the Colts were in play for Legarius Sneed, but again, I, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't have, I'm not privy to the negotiations to know if there's, you know, like, are, are they hoping that somebody else bows out? I, I don't know. I don't know any of that stuff. Uh, it's, it's just really hard to tell this week. Okay. So with that said, Joel, I'm going to ask you if they'd have an interest in a guy, right? Okay. But let me explain, because based on that, you're right. I mean, you know, do you have an interest in Patrick Mahomes? Sure. Yeah, great. You know what I mean? He's not available. Um, well, we don't know, right? Every, Jimmy, everything's available. <laughs> um, T. Higgins has requested a trade, allegedly, Correct. in Cincinnati. Franchise tagged 21.8. One would assume that he is basically going to replicate the exact money that Michael Pittman Jr. I think they're pretty similar players. Mm-hmm. Um. Would they have an interest in him? I, that goes back to your other point. But the question is, do they have the pocketbook for him? That's the bigger question. I, I don't I don't think so. And I think that the key quote is something Chris Ballard said at the Combine. I guess that's two weeks ago now. Um, is Because he, he was talking about the depth of the wide receiver class in the draft. And he was comparing it to the year that Pittman and Higgins were both drafted. And if you go back and look at that draft... Um, there's a ton of very productive wide receivers that came out of that, that particular draft. I, I would guess that with Pittman already under contract and with a super deep class of wide receivers in the draft, I would guess that the Colts probably feel that they don't necessarily need to have two $23, $24 million receivers at this point, especially considering that Higgins is probably going to cost your first-round pick, probably. As a wide receiver, so, yeah, because it's a tra- you'd have to trade for him, right? Yeah, yeah, you have to trade for him. So he's probably going to cost your first round pick. Just considering how much wide receivers are a priority, I mean, you want to do that plus another twenty four million? I don't know. I don't know, especially when, especially when the, the draft class is supposed to be that deep. Well, the other thing is, and you tell me, Joel, if I'm way off base here. Look, I love T. Higgins. I've watched a lot of T. Higgins play. I think he's a, a, a fine talent. But to me, he is a very similar talent to Michael Pittman. In other words, if I'm going to pay for that kind of a receiver, if I'm going to pay that kind of money for two receivers, I want them to be two guys that are kind of bringing two different recipes to the pitch in. And I feel like those two guys are very similar to one another. Am I off base? No, I, I, I'm – I'm right with you on this. I I think like there's, I think Higgins, if you look at his stats, has more yards per catch. But I I would really just attribute that to uh, one of them got to play with Joe Burrow, and one of them has played with a string of of not Joe Burrows. Um, I think they're very very similar players. I agree with that a lot. Um, and I I don't I just think that if you're trying to yeah I think if you're trying to get a receiver, what the Colts need. If they were trying to get somebody that big, I mean, it had to be somebody super downfield explosive, like no doubt, undoubtedly downfield explosive. I don't necessarily know that you're getting that from from Higgins. The guy, the guy in Cincinnati who's that is Jamar Chase, who's going to, I assume, sign an extension at some point for something that'll make Michael Pittman's twenty three point eight million dollars a year look pretty reasonable. Joel A. Erickson, our guest, covers the Colts for the Indianapolis Star. Joel, for the Colts in terms of a, a draft asset standpoint to go back to what Jake's question was about T Higgins and an acquisition there. And my question about Legereus Sneed, how conscious are the, how conscious of the Colts are of their draft pick war chest that they have in terms of not getting any from the supplemental picks that were, or the, uh, yeah, the supplemental picks that were given out the other day, just having their traditional picks, at their disposal, how sensitive are they about that in making a trade to acquire a player? Mm, I think I don't necessarily think it would it would meant it would make a big deal. I because I, I think Ballard probably feels like he can get those back. 
you know, if he trades a pick, I feel like he probably feels like he can trade back with something else and, and get those back if he feels like he needs it. I, I think the bigger thing is, you know, like the one time they made a trade like this where you gave up a pick, it was for DeForest Buckner, who at the time and still I would consider one of the top five or six defensive tackles in the NFL. You'd have to be looking at it like that. Like we're getting somebody who's a no doubt bona fide guy, which is I think why Legarius Sneed, would make sense. You, you, like he's, he's sort of in the same boat. He's at the end of his rookie deal. He's still young. Um, he's been very good and very durable. Um, but I don't necessarily think that the draft pick, the loss of the draft picks would be as big of a deal. Um, and honestly, this is, this is me talking more than trying to read what they're doing. I don't know that it should, given that they have a lot of young players, young sort of potential type, unproven-ish type players at a lot of spots. I, to me, like what they need is, is some guys who they know what they're going to do. In regards to them retaining Michael Pittman Jr., and for those that missed it, three years, $70 million extension reportedly agreed to between those two sides after the franchise tag was given out last week. In terms of that deal getting done, and I know that the thought was it would not be as contentious as what happened with Jonathan Taylor a year ago, and I know JT wasn't on the tag last year, so there were different elements to all of this, but what, if any, impact from those negotiations and the way they went initially last offseason might have contributed to them getting a deal done so quickly with Michael Pittman Jr.? Well, I think the biggest thing is just the different positional market. You know, there's there, there have been a couple of running back deals um, that have happened already. DeAndre Swift and Tony Pollard, who are, they're not Jonathan Taylor type running backs. They're, they're pretty good running backs. I think they got three years, eight million-ish, something like that, is what's been reported so far. Like The, the biggest difference is uh, with Taylor, as good as he is, his position has not been getting paid. Whereas with Pittman, Ballard said it at the end of the season, like you have to pay what the market is. And if it's $4, if you're paying for gas, then it's $4 a gallon, it's $4 a gallon. Like, the receiver market has been skyrocketing. I think right now, you know, Pittman's contract slots into the top 10. It, it probably won't by the end of this offseason because there's a bunch of guys who are going to get, like I mentioned, Jamar Chase, there's a bunch of guys like who are going about to get extensions that probably go over that. This is, this is just the going rate for wide receivers now. The going rate for wide receivers, if you have a good one, is starts at that 23 million range, 20 to 23 million range. And only goes up from there. And I think I think that's a big part of it is just recognizing either either we pay up or, or we lose him. Joel A. Erickson is our guest. Joel, how much of free agency do you think? You know, Eddie, we just had some movement within the AFC South, correct? That is correct. Gabe Davis uh was is signing with the Jacksonville Jaguars on a three year deal. Okay. So how much, Joel, do you think that free agency, maybe there's a danger in this. Teams can say they don't do it. How much do you think they counter rivals with exploration or signing of players? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I think that you probably should take it into account. I, I don't necessarily know. Like, for instance, even if it's not the division – um, I've kind of been saying that the Colts need to be real realistic with themselves about the, the quarterbacks they played last year and the quarterbacks that are on the schedule next year. Um, just for, for people who don't remember, the Colts played a, like a ton of backup quarterbacks right in a row last year. And next year the schedule includes guys like Josh Allen and Aaron Rodgers and um, Jordan Love and Tua Tungavailoa and all these explosive passing attacks. And I, I been thinking you know in the offseason you should be aware of that and and know what's what's on your schedule in terms of where you can take chances maybe if you're going to try to go with the young draft and develop route um in terms of the division the Colts have never operated in a way where they're good where they see somebody else signing people and, and sign a bunch of guys because obviously we've seen the Jaguars sign people for years and years and years now with varying levels of success, and the Colts haven't necessarily gone tit for tat with them. But I, I do think that you you probably need to take into account where, okay, the schedule looks like this. Um, 
we, we need to be prepared that we're going to play some, some pretty tough passing attacks this next year that we didn't play the year before. Joel, with the Jaguars signing Gabe Davis, it likely, I mean, not impossible, but it likely takes them out of the running to retain Calvin Ridley. When you look at the Colts from an offensive standpoint, would he be a fit here if they were to splurge in that specific market for free agency? Uh, he would fit. I mean, I, I think that there's definitely a spot for a number two um, or, or another or another outside receiver. I think the cost, again, though, going against the, when it, when you put it up against the the depth of the draft class, he, I think Ridley is probably. I don't know. It's hard to know if he's going to get like 20 million, but Ridley, Ridley's going to get a lot, and people will overpay for receivers in free agency. So I, I just think the cost is probably ultimately going to be prohibitive in terms of really making a play for a player like that. I, I, I keep going back to the, you know, Ballard is fond of always telling us that, you know, you know, Hey, it was in it, it, the, what, what we were going to do. It was in what I said, you just got to pay attention. He said a lot of stuff about the depth of the wide receiver and the draft class. And then he had another quote that was about, um, you know, you use free agency in spots where you don't think the draft class is going to be that deep and you use the draft class in spots where you don't think free agency is that deep. And I'm like, well, you just said wide receiver was really deep in, in the draft, so maybe I should be paying more attention there. Joel, over the weekend, Joel A. Erickson is our guest. You're a native of Wisconsin, right? I am, yes. You, had, you have friends that went to – you did not go to University of Wisconsin, correct? I did not go to the University of Wisconsin, but I did have friends that went there, okay. yes. Uh, over the weekend in St. Pete, I met a guy – cool guy – and he said that he was a golfer at University of Wisconsin. He grew up near Fargo, and he, he golfed on scholarship at University of Wisconsin. And then I got okay. to thinking that if you if you lived in Fargo, you got to golf 10 <laughs> days a year. And if you lived in University of Wisconsin, you get to golf 25 days a year. Uh, do they suck in golf? Do you know? Uh, there, there are nice golf courses in Wisconsin, obviously, right? But um, do you enjoy it both weeks that it's open? That's That's a really good question. So – the, like you're dead right. There's the golf courses in Wisconsin are really, really nice. Yeah, it's because like, they're only used 14 times, so they stay the pristine, lakes, right? There's a I know, but there's also like a bunch of lakes and hills and stuff that's good for golf courses. But you're right. You're also right that the snow, maybe not this year, but the snow generally lasts into April. And so I have never known the University of Wisconsin Madison to have a great reputation as a golfing school. Right. Um, you know, cross country, some some of those other sports they've been pretty good at, but I, I don't. I've never heard of them being good at golf. No. Here's the thing: it's not necessarily a positive when your golf course is most known for being awesome sledding hills, right? <laughs> Isn't that usually like a Correct. detriment to the to the golf itself? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, Correct. Okay. It's generally it's generally not the best. I know. I know as somebody who played uh, baseball. Uh, in high school that uh, I, I've told this before, but we used to have to go one of our first practices every year to my memory used to be that we used to go chip the ice off of the infield. Yeah. Come on, man. Uh, come on <laughs> at the, to, to help it thaw, help it thaw earlier. So yeah, the weather's, the weather's not, not great for, for the golf in, in spring and early Wisconsin. So you're saying they had quick melt out there. Is that a quick dry? It's what they're rolling with over there on the baseball. Right. Diamonds? No, I mean, it, it was like shovels and picks and stuff like that you let you know get the players some conditioning in by chipping some ice off the field brick dust and salt winning combo for any infield right uh joel lastly what's next like like what's the next thing i guess you know the Pittman domino was one we we expected to fall the franklin one was probably a little bit of surprise but good news the next thing now that we focus our attention towards is blank kenny moore for me kenny moore just the, where they are at corner um, I don't think it's that easy to fill the slot corner position. I mean, he plays outside when they only have two corners on the field, but for the most part, he's in the slot. Um, that's not exactly an easy position to fill. If you don't, if for some reason you didn't get him back, and I don't have any indication that that's not going to happen, but if, if for some reason you don't get him back, to me that becomes a massive hole. So Kenny Moore is the, is the one I'm looking at most right now. He is Joel A. Erickson, covers the Colts for the Indy Star. Joel, always appreciate catching up with you. And because I don't have a dog in the fight in this region of the country, uh, best of luck to your Brewers uh, this year. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I appreciate that. You're Thank welcome. You. No problem. <laughs> we'll talk to you next time. <laughs> you know, there were tons of people, tons of people 
in the airport yesterday in Florida from various teams down for spring training. I talked to one guy. I talked to one guy who's a Pirates fan. Uh, there were a ton of Phillies fans. Cute fellows down there. Well, I feel like if you're a diehard fan of baseball, th- that could be a spring break trip for you, right? It's yeah. go down there and, and see the team before the start of the regular season. You know, I, I've I've always liked Florida, especially around spring break time. But on Saturday night, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go find a place like to to have dinner and and be near the water. And I, I made the mistake of driving to Clearwater Beach. Like, what a nightmare! <laughs> I mean, I know I'm old, but I'm like, what a total disaster! Just to- people like, I mean, I mean, it, it was just. It's cool. I mean, that's and we're a little early for spring break, aren't we? A little bit, but what it what, was packed. What does this say about me? That as you know, today I had that appointment where sorry to trigger warning for those that don't like gross things, but Jake's already said it once on the air. Right? It's yeah, they dug your toenails, toenails out. out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But what does it say about me that the nurse that helped me thought that I was when I told her I'm going on vacation next week? She's like, "Oh, you're going to spring break? That's fun." And I didn't tell her, "No, no, I'm not going to Florida. I'm going to go lose money in Las Vegas. That's the that's the play." Does that is that Further my degeneracy uh, level, no, or that, is that I fair? I think that makes you spring break pre-kids. Okay. Or post-kids. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's how, and I don't mean that to say, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I think that that's, that's, here's the thing, though. That's kind of single guys spring break, or, and when I say single, I mean, you know, now that you're married, I get it, like, right, right, right. but but just. Yeah, not. I, I think a lot of people spring break is like for the the kids that are in school type sure, thing, right? Sure. Yeah, and that's probably what she was anticipating. You were saying, yes, you were going to say. Uh, did you tell me where you're staying in Las Vegas? Treasure Island. That is where you're staying. Yes, because uh, uh, you because you gave me the the room review. You said I, I was, yeah, it was, perfect, it was solid, perfectly sufficient. Yep. I, at least maybe I got lucky on the room that I had, but it was like st- I'll tell you what, we stayed at the St. Pete Marriott, which is a nice hotel over the weekend for the race. And I would say that the room that I had looked almost identical to the room I had at Treasure Island. Very similar. So, I mean, and let's face it, you're getting up and you're going out and you're leaving and you're coming back at midnight. You know what I mean? If I have complaints on the room, do I call the front desk or you? Like, who do I send those to? You call the St. Pete Marriott, Ah, actually, strangely enough.
right? Eddie, were you tapping your foot at the end? Were you still snapping I am your finger? Still a bit? tapping my. Okay. Eddie, did here. you find out the fate of Jeff Spicoli? Did you stick around for that? No. Come on, man. During the credits. During the closing credits, where it says what what happened to each person. Oh yeah, I watched that. All Ed, of them. Eddie's Marvel antenna ticked up. He thought it was a post credit scene that he missed no. when yeah, you said that. Yeah, sorry. Thank. You're and welcome. So, I understand. You're welcome. With that, you know um, that he, do you know what band he hired for his birthday? Oh, Van Halen, yeah. And he did it with the money from what? Oh, I can't remember that part. I just remember the Van Halen part of it. He saved Brooke Shields, got reward money, and spent it on Van Halen. Uh, Eddie saw Fast Times for the first time, by the way, over the weekend, so we're celebrating that. Now, next on the docket, you said, is what? Uh, do I, I don't know if I want to say this publicly or not. Go ahead. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, okay. that's a great one. I think it's a little over, it, it's okay. I it, think it's a little overrated. It, it is the, I would assume it still continues, but it is the quintessential spring break last week of that session. Teachers have finished all the lesson plans. Let's throw on a movie. Oh, it's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Like that was always the film in high school and junior high where if they're throwing on a movie, that's likely what it's going to be. I, I think of Ferris Bueller's Day Off as kind of in the same category as Back to the Future. Like, it's good, but it's not, it doesn't have, like, the the, the whatever legacy of, like, a fast time. Well, but it, but it... Revenge of the Nerds is way up there, too. You've seen Revenge of the Nerds, Jimmy? I have not. That's way up there, man. But on, like, the to your point about Ferris Bueller's Day Off and more so Back to the Future, there are enough of a cult following to those two films where the status gets elevated. Like, you, like... Back to the Future, I think, is still, especially that series of movies, is still viewed by many as a, as a great collection of cinema. Right. I think it still carries weight, but to I, your point, to some, maybe a little overrated. Now, last night were the Academy Awards, right? Yeah, that's the first year in a minute I didn't watch. And it wasn't, like, to be clear, it wasn't intentional. I just was so caught up in basketball and everything else that I just didn't tune in. You know what I think has, has partially hurt the Oscars? Go ahead. Is, is just the streaming nature of it. And being able to bet on it, yeah. <laughs> that was the disappointing part. We dropped the ball in part because Jake was not here. We were going to give some Oscar bets to end the show on Friday. Oh, really? We did not, though. Why not? Because, A, we forgot, and, B, you weren't here. But I think that... It... I did see the best picture, though. I was proud of myself for that. I saw Oppenheimer. I really enjoyed it during the summer. Went and saw it. Shout out to the uh, Indiana State Museum right there uh, across from Victory Field. They have that like big, big, big IMAX screen that there's only like 24 of in the United States. Saw it on there. It was awesome. Great. Now, my thing with the Academy Awards is simply this. And I'm not saying it's not still a huge deal and whatever else. I, I just think that it's a little bit more challenging now. And, and I really hope this comes back. I love going to movies. I, mean, I love it. Like, just the whole experience of it. Especially, like, rainy Saturdays in, in January. You know what I mean? It reminds you of like being a kid and spending all day at the theater. But It is back, Jake, but not like the every film. Correct. Right? Like spectacles. Like I saw Dune 2 last week. Very yeah. blockbuster spectacle, massive film. So I think that when, like movie watching still, you know, there's so much just streaming now, and there are so many movies that, you know, Back in the day, quote unquote, when it was like direct to video, that meant like C movie. And now I think so many people are seeing things like on the iPad or, you know, on whatever or at home, just, you know, like on a plane. I mean, obviously sure. by that I mean, but or like at home, just streaming it, that it takes away from the like the fear of missing out factor of a big movie blockbuster yeah. where it's like, man, everybody's going to see this movie. And Used to be you'd have maybe it's five harder, of those a year. Yeah, now there's and maybe it's harder one to keep two. up with, like where you know, ever like Oppenheimer. Obviously, everybody like that was talked it. about the, the Barbie movie to some extent last year. Top Gun the year before that. Yeah, like any Marvel movie. I mean, I don't know what the, you know, it used to be. I think that most people like had seen four of the six final sure. you know, Best Picture nominees, and now I think a lot of people probably haven't even heard of four of the six. Yeah. But I was obviously flying last night, so I didn't see if there were any, like, quote-unquote, big Oscar moments type thing. You know, great speeches, that kind of thing. From what I understand, uh, they 
Al Pacino botched the uh, announcement of Best Picture. He forgot to say, hey, the nominees are. And so he was just opened the envelope and he was like, oh, I, spoiler alert, if you are taping an award show, he was like, oh, I see Oppenheimer. And everybody was confused because like they had that snafu with La La Land and Moon yeah, Knight yeah, yeah. a couple years ago. And then it turns out that they did win it. There wasn't like it wasn't like that level. But that was Steve the Harvey in on the thing. on the deal. John Cena <laughs> walked out naked. That is true. It happened. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. John Cena walked out naked. He buried it all. He had just the envelope over his uh, man. We package on there. That's fine. Right. Okay. Manhood's fine. Okay. And then they put they like during when they said the nominees. Was it a legal envelope or like a? <laughs> I mean, that's a burning question. There. Right? Uh, I would say more Manila folder. Okay. By the way, Eddie, did you just make popcorn? I did. Yes. Am I going to get crucified for this? Well, it smells kind of like fried ch- or, or like a like breaded chicken in here. I did think okay. you kind of were stealthy about the popcorn, possibly to avoid this whole thing popping up on the air. <laughs> Microwave popcorn, though. Okay, Eddie. Eddie's a perfectionist with it, though. Microwave I will give him popcorn that. does not smell bad. Don't get me wrong. I like microwave popcorn. It's just fine. Unless, but there is a but. Microwave popcorn and. Seafood are two things that typically are frowned upon in a work environment of using the corporate microwave. See, I right? would disagree with that. The only way that popcorn gets put in there is if it's burnt. Correct. That's what. But I that's mean, that's the risk reward you the, run. The, but the the margin for error. Oh, you got about it's a, a three second game, margin Jake. for error, right? Very dangerous game. Now you guys are too young to remember the magic of being able to watch the Jiffy Pop. That was good living. They had it wasn't at that level, but I do remember that as a kid. Vaguely in the nineties, we definitely and, had some Jiffy Pop at some point in time. Yeah, I mean, you sit there and you, you know, it's awesome. Yep. Um, Pacers last night in Orlando, pretty pretty good performance for them because that is a team that now without Benedict Mather, and we haven't talked a lot about this, but it, it's obviously come out um, over the course of the weekend, so we probably should. The fact that Benedict Matherin is going to be out for the year with a shoulder surgery. I immediately had flashbacks to, oh, my gosh, we're going to start talking about, like, you know, snowboarding incidents and subluxations, and it was like Andrew Luck all over again. But uh, he's having surgery that they believe will be a full repair, and then Benedict Matherin will be good to go next season, full throttle. But what this does now, Jimmy, you have no Buddy Heald. You have no Benedict Matherin. You know who becomes a mainstay now for and a very important pl- player for the Pacers? I would throw out any of Ben Shepard or Jairus Walker. Ben Shepard? Well, both probably, right? Yeah. But Ben Shepard for certain, right? Yeah. And this isn't – this is an injury that really stinks for right now. But it may turn out to help them in the long run. Because look at, and I'm going to go on the way back here. When Rick Smith was drafted to the Pacers. You're going to get in the DeLorean? I am. Great, Scott. When Rick Smith was drafted by the Pacers, there was not a lot of expectation that he was going to see significant minutes or even was ready to play significant minutes as a rookie. But Steve Stepanovich was hurt. And so... Smith's had to play right away. And I think that went a long way in developing and accelerating the development of Rick Smith's in what turned out to be obviously a very, very good career. Ben Shepard has already, I think I told the story last week about a game, and it might have been Matherin. I think it was Matherin picked up a late foul, and Rick Carlisle turns around to the bench. I mean, the, the trainer comes up to tell Carlisle, and that's four on Ben. And literally instantly, Carlisle, like instinctively, without even thinking about it, it's not like he, he sat and thought. As soon as he said to him, we'll do it this way. I'll be Carlisle. You be the trainer. Say in my ear, that's four on Matherin. Coach, that's that's four on Matherin. Ship! Ship! I mean, it was instant, like, like instinctive, get in the game. And that was late in the game in clutch moment for Ben Shepard. So Shepard already is in the rotation. But this now accelerates not only his getting into the game, but also probably elongates how long he's in the game and the different things that they expect of him. And then perhaps, yes, maybe Jarris Walker gets into the rotation 
where he would not have been before, and it gets his feet wet to the point where when those guys now, if next year you get to the point where they are then backed out to being like guys seven and eight or eight and nine, they're more than ready for those moments. It's baptism by fire, especially for Jairus Walker. You are throwing him out there not unprepared because he's been up and down but shine more often than not, especially the second half of the season in the small minutes that he's gotten within the rotation by comparison to everybody else. And we know what he's capable of in terms of the experience and his time spent down with the Mad Ants in the G League. It's a great opportunity for him. It's a great opportunity for Ben Shepard. It is heavy reliance now, though, on Pascal Siakam, on Tyrese Halliburton, on Neesmith and Nemhard, on Miles Turner, on that starting five to be positioned game by game where you're not having to ask as much as you have in the past of that second unit, which is a weird thing to say because what's the biggest strength outside of Tyrese Halliburton that we have talked about all year? It's been their depth. And effectively what's happened, Jake, in a weird way, if you're being glass half full about this and you have to bend and be gymnastics with it too for this to fully make sense, I get that because in a perfect world, this would not be how it happened. And Benedict Matherin certainly would not have been taken out of the rotation. You are effectively at a month to go in the season due to his absence now out for the year, you are automatically shrinking your rotation to where right. you were going to do in the playoffs, except Matherin would not have been a casualty to that. He would have been in a consistent role. So now you have a basically a month, and yes, there are some tough spots on the schedule the rest of the way for the Pacers, but for every tough matchup, there's a Chicago or a Brooklyn games you should win on the road at Detroit. I'm not trying to fully undercut those teams, but there's tougher opponents mixed in there. Oklahoma City, Golden State, L.A. This is going to be a difficult fight to the finish for the Pacers. But if they're able to do what they did against Orlando last night, especially on the defensive end, where they really shine specifically in that third quarter, I don't think this is going to be the bottom falls out that we think it might be for what the Pacers can still do this year. It's a loss. It will be one that's felt, but it doesn't fully derail in my mind where they're in position to be, which is be a playoff, not a play-in, a playoff team, but they're going to have to get more, especially defensively, out of this group for the final month of the season to do that. There are many that believe that the Pacers are destined to have to play into the play, play in game for the playoffs. The play in round. And it's not an irrational thought. It, it's a fair thought. And, and one of those that could be in that area with them, and this is the good news, I guess, is, and I think this team is headed to greener pastures, admittedly, but you want to set yourself the barometer against a team like Orlando, right? I sure. mean, and, and, you know, Philly is is hanging around there as well, but obviously they, they've got injuries they're dealing with. If you look at the play-in field right now, let's say the Pacers are in the play and they're the seventh seed. They're better than Atlanta. They're better than Chicago. Miami's weird. I mean, they've got four or five games to have to comfort here, right? Right, but, but if they're trapped in the play-in, even just let's say they stick at the seventh seed. They don't fall, but they the seventh right. seed, they host the eight. It's a good feeling with where this team is. And to go back to what you keep referencing, Jake, you know, about once a week when we get to this conversation of – this was a year where expectations were not, this is the leap forward year. This is still a part of their rebuild process. I know that you and I have disagreed a little bit on that once you acquired Siakam, but regardless, let's operate underneath the idea, the play-in would be a win for them. You want to look around the rest of the teams in the play-in and say they're better off than those teams. And they are for the most part outside of maybe Miami because Jimmy Butler exists and Bam Adebayo exists. Have you ever seen that video of the panda eating carrots? Seen pandas eating bamboo before, but I don't think I've ever seen very carrots. similar. There's the one that with the the there's a panda eating a carrot. It's the greatest thing ever, right? He's just sitting there chilling. Eating That's kind of what Eddie looks like eating his popcorn. <laughs> He's very methodical in the way that he eats his popcorn. Like I, when I eat popcorn, it's all, like it's let's go. It's all like oh yeah. Eddie's very methodical. Well, he's probably trying to also not make a mess because he has a job to do still. I don't think this is. Movie watching Eddie popcorn consumption. I think did this you is watch popcorn? Works now. Or did you eat popcorn while watching Fast Times at Ridgemont High? No. Did you have snacks of any sort? Um, I had a brownie. Are you, you a popcorn guy when Excuse it comes me? to movies? 
I'm was brownie. Was it brownie? No. <laughs> no. Well, you watched with your parents, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, was me. The, how was the Phoebe Cates, Brad Hamilton scene with the parents in the room? Was that awkward? My mom was like, my mom wasn't paying attention when we turned it on, and she goes, what is this? Yeah, I'll bet, yeah. Well, and then what about the scene with <laughs> Stacy and Damone? What about it? Was that awkward with the parents watching? Not really. Do you I mean, usually... it was the third time, the third scene, so no, it wasn't. <laughs> Do you usually eat popcorn when you watch a movie? Um, If I'm at the theater, yeah. If I'm at home, no. All right. By the way, I can't attest. The movie going experience go, is still there, Jake. I really Don't worry. gotta go. What's that? The movie going experience is still there. Don't worry. I hope it's not for every picture, I... but there, it's still it's still a good time. The last, you know, the last movie that we went to was. I, I will admit, we went to this movie, and, and I'm like, there was a, a younger actress in it, a young actress in it, and I was like, I think she's pretty hot, and like seems pretty talented, and it was a complete like B C movie. And then once again, like, I was like, wait a minute. Like, I should be a talent agent because she's blown up since then. I'll tell you who it was. And we'll talk to Dustin Dopier right, coming up in just a couple minutes as well. Hey, guys. Looking for a reason?
You just heard J&B mention basketball at all levels. How about the crowds that showed up for some high school basketball this weekend? Exceptional. Saw a picture from Southport. Saw one from Newcastle. Regionals were in full force last week. 8,500 at Newcastle, right? Mm-hmm. Packed. Is Mr. Basketball settled? Does it automatically go to Flory Badunga from Kokomo? I mean, definitely deserving, right? Fishers is really good, right? Yeah. I mean, their best player is at La Lumiere, however you say that. I can never say it. But I, I was just happy to see big crowds return because it hasn't always been that way, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to think that on a yearly basis you're going to get that type of high-level support for all these young kids working towards, you know, for some their final games in a high school uniform, for others just trying to chase an opportunity to win a regional or a semi-state or a state title. So, yeah, to be able to see that level of crowd and support over the weekend – when we kind of close the show with that of, hey, go enjoy conference tournaments, yes, in the college level, but don't forget about the high school ranks. Go out and support local athletes in this thrilling time to be a Hoosier. So you've got still alive at the 4A level, locally speaking. you got Fishers, you've got Lawrence North, you got Ben Davis, Center Grove, right? Yes. And then obviously a ton of smaller schools as well, like in 3A, you know, Garen's still alive, Danville, Park Tudor. I don't want to leave anybody out, right? But a lot of local teams, Delta. Park Tudor's pretty good. Are they? Yeah, I had their game Saturday. You know, the the one player, there's always there are always players that you're like, wait, but that guy's from here? Do you do either one of you guys remember when Jackson Jr. was playing for Park Tudor? Who's now an absolute beast for the Memphis Grizzlies? A little bit, yeah. I, I mean I mean, I knew of him, but like it wasn't like he was dominant like some of the other players that you hear about. Right? I didn't, I didn't carry the same weight for me as like Trayvon Blewett or Yogi. That's what Farrell. I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, both from Park. Trayvon Tudor. Blewett was a huge scorer, right? Yeah. Uh, Dustin is Dustin next, Eddie. Is it Dopirak, right? Mm-hmm. Can you say that out? Like, can you say it for me though? Like, how do you pronounce it exactly? <laughs> how how exactly do you say the name? Dopirak. No, but I said Dopirak. Yeah, I, I say I say Dustin Dopirak. Dopirak. Yep. Dopirak. Yeah. Why are your eyes watering? Because you went to me on are purpose. Because sure I have just a put brownie, and that's why now you're you no. face palming the popcorn. My mother would never. <laughs> Dustin's next. Are you dealing with foot, knee?
better, don't you, Eddie? Oh, yeah. Spicoli's dancing along to the... Mr. Vargas brought his wife, by the way. <laughs> it's the last school fiesta of the year. I know people can't see or hear what we talk about during the break, but this last break was just Jake quoting the entire movie. <laughs> Fast times are really <laughs> The high. entire time. It's the best. Uh, joining us now, did you say he's a baggage claim? Yeah. That would be in Oklahoma City, right? Yes. Now, Dustin Dopierak, the Indianapolis star, is in Oklahoma City because the Pacers are next there after their win last night in Orlando. Uh, my understanding is in Oklahoma City, they have a Cowboy Hall of Fame. Are you going to swing by there? You know, I might. <laughs> I mean, I will at least, I'm at least close to it. I think it's by, I think it's in Bricktown, I want to say. It's close to where I'm staying. Um, so you never know. I'm, I'm not sure. I could do it. We'll see. I've got a couple days. I thought you were going to ask him if he's at Carousel 1 or Carousel 2. Yeah, what, has, has your bag come around the corner yet? It, it just did, like right as uh, right as you guys started talking. So you're not at the point where you're starting to get nervous and look around. You're like, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure that guy was on my flight, so I think I am at the right one. You've done that before, right? <laughs> no, I'm past that, past that, have the bag, going to sit down somewhere away from the conveyor belt so I can actually hear you. Okay. But, yeah, all good, past the nervous point. Uh, last back. night, solid win for Indiana over Orlando, Dustin, without Benedict Matherin. Let's begin with that. Were you surprised by the Matherin storyline, I guess, and how much of that was them just saying, you know what, let's just nip this in the bud now instead of letting it prolong? Yeah, I mean, I don't think they expected it to be a tear. Um, you know, that that's my basic idea. I mean, I obviously talked to Rick on um, – what was it? I mean, the, 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 the next availability after he got after they got back. So, so like in Dallas, I think he took the shot in Dallas. Um, and I think somebody put you know put it out on Twitter when he kind of got um, you know knocked over, um, and he played through it. So it, you know played through most of it. I think it was a situation where they didn't realize it was a tear. They originally had it had it listed as a sprain. Uh, you know, saw him with an ice pack after that game. Just didn't think too much of it, honestly. Uh, because again, he played like the last two quarters and scored, I think, 19 points in that game. I mean, he, you know, I, I don't, you know, he looked fine to me. Uh, and I think they were a little bit surprised to, to, to find out, to find a tear in an MRI. Um, you know, I think uh, Tony asked yesterday in Orlando, you know, basically just to get some kind of timeline from Rick on, you know, when did you guys, when did you guys find out when? Because you were thinking sprain in maybe a week. You know, what told you tear? Um, and you know, he just sort of like just don't go there. But I think basically it's just like an MRI situation when you when you see a, tear, a torn muscle. Uh, yeah, you don't want to just try to play through it and see how it goes. Uh, you know, especially a, a younger player like that, uh, you want to get it corrected and not mess around. I mean, I, I don't I don't imagine there was a lot of thought of let's see if he can play through a labrum tear. Pacers beat writer for the Indy Star doesn't appear like is our guest. Dustin, we knew going into the final month of the season as we've you know approached that threshold, maybe an extra game or two here and there, but you get the timeline of mapping out. We knew that eventually the rotation was going to shrink once the playoffs arise because that's what all teams do. A 10-man rotation gets down to a 7- or 8-man rotation. This is a glass-half-full question, but does this, in the immediate, make them shrink the rotation, or are they still going to rely on on their depth to carry them through on a nightly basis? I mean, they're, they're probably going to roll about nine deep most nights. It's just kind of, kind of question of whether Jairus Walker gets minutes. Um, I mean, I guess they could go 10 deep when they get Doug McDermott back from a calf strain. I, I think they have to see what he can do, honestly, because I think they, they, they need a little bit more wing outside shooting, uh, you know, from that unit, basically. I think they, they, they got to at least see if they can have it, uh, because I think they're, they're missing some three-point shooting gravity. Um, and, I, I, you know, obviously, I think just since the Buddy Hill trade, that's been something that's been lacking. Certainly, Ben Shepard can hit them. Uh, Obi Toppin can hit them. Jalen Smith can hit them as, as four and five guys. But I think you could use something out of those wings. So I don't know that they're necessarily going to go down um, to like a, an eight man rotation just yet if they don't have to. Um, but I think they have right now, they have nine guys they really trust. And I think they, they absolutely think they feel like they have to play Shepard, definitely feel like they have to play Toppin, definitely feel like they have to play Jalen Smith, definitely feel like they have to play TJ McConnell. Um, so I don't think they see um, a path to cutting it down to eight right now and in terms of what they need and i think they they obviously do very much see their depth as a strength and one of the biggest you know pieces for them is i don't think they see that huge of a gap um in terms of talent between you know basically what they have in the first team and what they have in the second team uh second unit you know it's it's 
certainly has a bigger gap than it was, uh, you know, when they had Matherin and when they had Heald and those guys. Um, but I, I still don't think that they feel like they can just ride that first unit and expect it to carry them all the way. Dustin, one of the things that I had mentioned that I think the Pacers most miss with the departure of Buddy Heald, and I want you to expand on this and feel free to disagree, I, I think that Doug McDermott offered them – kind of a reprieve or a softening of the wound of losing the outside shooting that Buddy Heald brought to the table. But what's going to be really challenging for them is trying to find – Heald could slide around around the perimeter and and move from point to point so quickly that Mm -hmm. it kept defenses honest, and I think it really facilitated for great ball movement for Indiana. It spear-jumped their ball movement. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. How do they replicate that, or can they, in his absence? Yeah, I mean, honestly, Halliburton's trying by by playing a little bit off the ball more. Um, you know, he's looking at it as okay. Well, I'm I'm the guy with the gravity now, um, so I have to do some of that and, and play off. You know, he's obviously getting some more. Uh, you know, certainly starting with Nemhart and Nemhart's, you know, bringing the ball up some. Uh, and he's getting minutes with T.J. McConnell when when Halliburton's really playing off the ball in those scenarios, and really McConnell's bringing the ball up more frequently. He was just talking about that a little bit last night, um, and uh, I think he was asked, you know, I think last week about screening more. You know, you, you're seeing. Uh, Halliburton do some of this more sort of like off the ball, you know, kind of ghost screen stuff, blurs, that kind of thing. And that was really the buddy healed thing. And Halliburton's been trying to do it. And he said, you know, like he, he was sort of analyzing that piece about how, what made Buddy so good at it? He, you know, he, like because they're them, and they, you know, he and Buddy just sort of rip each other like they do. He said, you know, I, I think he was terrible at actually setting the screen, but he was really good at, at sort of blurring and ghost screening people and just forcing people to follow him, um, and and just creating just a, enough not chaos and havoc that's probably put, put, putting a little bit far but you know just keeping guys around him and opening up space for other guys and that really w- worked really well for opening Halliburton uh up and Halliburton's trying to do that for some other people um but again you know like I, Halliburton's obviously struggling admittedly struggling to shoot the ball outside um and it's just a new thing that he's tr- got to figure out he's used to more frequently playing with the ball he's got to learn uh you know get used to more sort of off the ball scenarios um, and he was just so schooled at that because that's what he did for the entire. That's what he has done for the entirety of his career. So I mean, and there's not a guy who's just basically at schooled as being that guy as Buddy Hield is. So they have to kind of um, make up for it in pieces. And I guess Halliburton's going to do a lot of it, but it's just it's not the same as having Buddy out there. Pacers beat writer for the Indy Star, Dustin Dupirac, nice enough to take some time with us. Dustin, you mentioned Tyrese Halliburton a couple of times there, and I know the three point percentage hasn't been back. But over the last four games, since we got into that conversation post-All-Star break of is he in a slump, 12 points, 8 assists, 19 points, 11 assists, 23 points, 13 assists, 20 points, 8 assists for Tyrese Halliburton. They've gone 2-2 two and two during that stretch. Is he back to form, and was that just a rut that he was in, or do we still need to see a larger game sample size before you're willing to go that far? I mean, he's got to hit outside shots. I don't think it's a scenario of, you know, there's something deeply ingrained wrong with him that, like, I don't think it's a scenario like, oh, the hamstring is killing him and he's not the same guy or anything like that. But the outside shot's just not going down. Uh, and, and that's an issue. I mean, there's it's just a struggle in and of itself. And sometimes you just hit those spaces where you're just having a hard time knocking down outside ones. But I think he's doing a better job through the course of games of, of finding his offense, of figuring out ways to create, uh, you, know, get, you know, get to the rim, basically score that way, get some points that way, get fouled, um, and create for others. And I think he's done a good job of that the last couple of games to be like, okay, just get over the fact that the three's not falling down, you know, shoot through it, still try to hit one or two if you can, uh, but find other ways to get buckets. Obviously, he had the uh, the, the running hook last night. I thought it was a uh, pretty slick move, and and just a couple, you know, abilities, where you, opportunities where you just saw him, you know, find a space where he could split a couple defenders and blow right by guys. And so that's still there, and that tells me just the athleticism still there. The, the hamstring's not killing him. It's not a physical issue. It's just a case of you know he is in a a shooting slump. I don't think it's a a, a physical thing where there's something hampering the shot. Um, but he's just not on target right now, and and it's a thing that he's just got to continue to shoot through. In terms of Oklahoma City, Dustin, you've been there Mm -hmm. how many times? This is my second. Underrated or overrated or on par with what one would think? Um, I don't mean the team. I mean the city. I know. I know. I figure – 
I think underrated only because I, I just saw Jay Michael yesterday. He was at, uh, uh, you know, obviously he's, he's down there working for the Sentinel, so he came to the game last night, and he said he thinks it's his least favorite field tri- or road trip. Um, I mean, there's stuff to do, you know. I mean, it, there's not nothing. So, I mean, I guess if you imagine it's a total wasteland, then it's, then it's underrated. Um, you know, compared to most other NBA cities, it's not nearly as happening. Um, but there's stuff, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, like, the, you know, like I said, I'm staying in like brick down. There's a few bars, restaurants, that kind of thing. It's obviously extremely flat. Um, and you know, not that, uh, you know, just from an aesthetic standpoint, it's, it, it's not that eye catching. Um, but, but there are worse. And, and again, like, I mean, mostly I go by like, are the hotels cheap enough that I could stay close to the arena and is there other stuff there to do once I'm there? And so on that scale, it, it's, it's okay. You know, it's, it's pretty good. There, there are worse. I mean, there's places where. So it's 1994, no it's 1994, Indianapolis. Something like that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's probably fair. Uh, that's what I imagine 1994 Indianapolis to be. Okay, fair enough. Not terrible. Dustin, mm-hmm. the rest of the way, if you're mapping this out, looking at the loss to Benedict Matherin, and let's just say for the sake of argument that Tyrese Halliburton rediscovers his ability from beyond the arc, from a standings aspect of all of this, they are a game back now of the Magic for the five seed, half came out of the six with Philadelphia, and while they are still have Miami breathing down their neck, eight, nine, ten seed, they have, or nine and ten seed, I beg your pardon, multiple game edge. Where does this thing go for the Pacers, if you had to predict it right now? Can they still stabilize and be a playoff team, or are they destined for the play-in? I mean, it's such a tough call because, like, it's there's just so many moving parts with the rest of them. Um, you know, because obviously they're in that five-team pack with it's the Knicks, it's Philly, it's Orlando, it's them, it's Miami. I, I, I just presume that Jimmy Butler's going to, you know, like catch some level of fire here and just get Miami up into the top six. I mean, that's just my presumption based on how everything else is going. Um, you know, at, at some point I imagine the Knicks will get right um, and, you know, be the class of that group. Um, but Philly, you don't know when, you know, and beats coming back. Um, so I think they're, they're going to continue to struggle. So I think they can catch Philly. Um, Orlando apparently, and I haven't really looked at this, but Orlando apparently has a really favorable schedule down the stretch. Like you know, that that should put them in. I mean, I think that the bottom line is they're going to be right on the brink. I mean, they're going to be right on the brink. And, and the one issue, you know, not the one issue, they have several issues, but one big issue that they have uh, is they just haven't shown the capacity to string off wins. Um, you know, I think the longest they've they've had one streak, I think, longer than three. Um, and they, they might be more than that, but I think they had like a five, six game winning streak right around. Um, right after Christmas, and since then they haven't won more than three in a row, and sort of everybody else is able to catch fire for at least a little bit and win, you know, seven, eight out of ten, and, and the Pacers haven't shown a capacity to do that. Um, so I think they're going to stabilize. I mean, I don't think that you have to worry about them falling down to the nine, um, and I think they're going to have a they're going to have a shot at the six till the end. But um, I mean, I think they end up being a playing team just because they haven't shown the, the consistency uh, to be able to string a bunch of wins together and put them in a safer position. Dustin Dopierak is our guest, of course, with the Indianapolis Star, talking about the Pacers. Um, Dustin, we mentioned this earlier. I want you to elaborate on it. We touched on it a little bit there. I, you know, with 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 Matherin out now, Ben Shepard becomes very important. Walker probably as well. To appease, I guess, or ease, I guess, is a better way of saying it. To ease the mind of Pacer fans worried about this, is there a silver lining in the fact that this was always thought to be like a two- to three-year process, and this might accelerate for younger guys their role and thus only help Indiana in the long run? Or is that too Pollyanna? It's a little It's a little Pollyanna just in the sense that I, I don't think anything that um, – I think whatever they get out of a postseason run is sort of more – important overall than whatever minutes they get for Walker, Walker and Shepard down the stretch. I mean, I think Shepard's already kind of got the, you know, season that you wanted from him. So basically like everything's ravey for him from this point, they've obviously figured out that he can play within the system. He can get up there and defend. He can hit shots. You know, they're, they're not really worried about sort of grooming him. Um, and he can get better and better, but I think ultimately you look at him and say, that's who Ben Shepard is. You know, now you kind of know who Ben Shepard is, which is really helpful going forward. It's good that they know that. Um, but it's like there's 
not a huge ceiling on it, but the floor is high and it's important. It's, you know, he's, he's a good three and D wing that can really guard shooting guards really well uh, and keep guys in front of him. That's re- it's a really important piece. I mean, it's, it's, it's really good that they identified that and uh, got that, I think, big of a hit with the number 26 pick. Um, but I think, you know, Walker obviously is going to need some more time and, I, I guess there's some value for whatever minutes he's going to get, but I mean, it doesn't seem like Carlisle is going to just throw 10 to 15 at him a night uh, and let him figure it out. They're not going to let him in there if he feels like he's not helping them. And last night they felt like he wasn't helping them, so they pulled him out for three minutes and then put him back in. So I think they still view the potential postseason experience as more important than that. I think they view this as a team that is supposed to win and supposed to at least get in the postseason, feel what, feel what that's like, um, and, you know, it, take that on going from there and that that experience is important for this group as they build towards being more of a championship contender but i think they view that as this team's step in being a championship contender is to get in the playoffs and be competitive when they get there uh whether that means win a series or not i think they view that that might be as icing on the cake but i think it's get in there play somebody that you can compete with um and and make some noise and, and basically you know it, it, even if you don't beat them you know make sure they knew they played you um, so I think that's kind of the more important thing. And I think it's harder to do that without Benedict Matherin. Um, so I, I think ultimately on balance, uh, it's a loss that way. Again, there's going to be some value for Ben Shepard. There's going to be some value for Jer- for Jarris Walker. Um, and, but I think there was going to be more value for Benedict Matherin to get in those scenarios and, and get towards being the franchise pillar that they think that he is. Um, so it is still a bigger loss than it is a gain. Um, but there is some silver lining in there, and, and it doesn't bury them either. I mean, like losing him doesn't mean that they're just, they're not going to you know make that kind of run. But it's it is a more significant loss than it is a game. He's Dustin Depierat covers the Pacers for the Indy Star. Pacers winners of two of their last three, trying to make it three of their last four when they take on Oklahoma City on the road tomorrow night. Dustin will cover that for the Star as he always does. Always good to chat with you, Dustin. Safe travels back home, and we will talk to you as the season rolls on. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, um, appreciate it, Dustin. Last night I was traveling back from St. Pete, and I met Josh, graphic designer, who is now the official graphic designer for the company, as a matter of fact. And we were sitting there chatting in the airport, and he mentioned where his kids go to school. And I said, well, you must live near where I do. And he said, yeah, and he lives like five minutes from me. And so I ended up giving him a ride home last night. We were chatting, and super guy and was telling me about how he and his wife are in the process of adopting two foster children, two foster boys that they took in whose parents, unfortunately, had suffered addiction. Just a a super guy and um, really enjoyed talking with him. And and one of the things that he said to me, because I I asked him, I said, so what do you like or not like about our show? Usually anticipating that people will say they like the two of you and don't like me. And he said, well, one of the things I like is how you will mention like different historical aspects of Indianapolis because I'm not from Indianapolis. Um, And in that capacity, and and I told him I appreciated that. And one of those things historically that Indianapolis champions when it comes to sports is going to be taking place tomorrow. And pull up a chair for a quick minute here of Uncle Jake's story time. Um, Back in... I, I think sometimes we forget about the fact that basketball and and I guess it's a good thing that for younger people that are, they would be unaware of this, but you know that we one time lived in a segregated society. We talked about that a lot with Oscar Robertson. And there are those that used sport to unify and break down racial barriers and integrate segregated lives. And John McClendon is one of those men who is a, an inductee into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame as a contributor, then later as a coach. He went to the University of Kansas. He studied under James Naismith, the game of basketball. And John McClendon eventually became the head coach at North Carolina College, which actually was known in the 30s and 40s as North Carolina College for Negroes. And he was the head basketball coach there. And during the war in 1944, he organized a game between his team and Duke University, which was obviously an all-white school. And so the two of them are an all-white team, I should say. So Duke and North Carolina College on March 12th of 1944 played what was known as the secret game where his team using a fast break style that later 
kind of introduced fast break into basketball and changed the way basketball was played. But they were victorious in the secret game that was played behind essentially locked doors because the thought of black players and white players sharing the same auditorium, the same gymnasium, or the same floor was very frowned upon, unfortunately, by a large part of our society in 1944. So on March 12th of 1944, the secret game took place. How does this tie into Indiana history? Well, it has a couple of variables in which you could relate it to Indianapolis. First off, the very first African-American sportscaster in Indianapolis was Jerry Harkness. And Jerry Harkness had played collegiately at Loyola. Loyola, which won the national championship in college basketball in the 60s, on their path in the NCAA tournament, had to play Mississippi State. The governor of Mississippi tried to pass an injunction prohibiting Mississippi State from playing against Loyola. But the coach and the team of Mississippi State snuck out essentially in the middle of the night to play the game against Loyola, and they Loyola defeated Mississippi State. And there was a very famous pregame handshake between the white players of Mississippi State and the players of the integrated Loyola team with Jerry Harkness, who was the captain, shaking hands at midcourt. And Jerry Harkness, who became an Indiana Pacer and then later worked for WTHR here in Indianapolis and is an absolute crown jewel of this city that unfortunately is no longer with us but was the definition of grace. Those doors were open for Jerry Harkness and his Loyola teammates because of the secret game that took place on March 12th of 1944 and John McClendon's team. John McClendon then became the head basketball coach at Cleveland State University in 19, I believe it was 66. And that essentially was the beginning of the integration across the sphere of college basketball because he was the first African-American head coach at a predominantly white institution when he was hired by Cleveland State in 1966. Cleveland State will be playing tonight against number one seeded Oakland in the Horizon League semifinals at the Indiana Fairgrounds uh, Coliseum. And then Northern Kentucky and Milwaukee will play after that with the championship game for the Horizon League taking place tomorrow night on the 80th anniversary of the secret game that John McClendon and his North Carolina school played against Duke. That game is going to be honored tomorrow night. The secret game will be honored for the 80th anniversary as part of the tie-in for the Horizon League and tipping the cap not only to John McClendon's social change that he brought to the game of basketball, but also that in terms of the integration of basketball at Cleveland State, which of course is now a Horizon League school and will be participating. So there will be proclamations from governmental officials tomorrow night. There will be recognition of the 80th anniversary and there will be, uh, hopefully by all that are intent, that are attending, an opportunity to sit back, reflect, and celebrate the fact that we now, as an integrated group, can watch the greatest game being played and watch it played in one of the great venues here in central Indiana as somebody, one of those teams, whether it be Oakland, Cleveland State, Northern Kentucky, or Milwaukee, tomorrow night will punch their ticket into the NCAA tournament. We'll continue the conversation here. You're listening to it on a Monday. It's Quarry and Company, 93.5, 107.5, The Fan. We're the Hillsburg Wedding Band. And this-
got duped into showing up at Mr. Hand's class by thinking there was a birthday party for him. Later, there was a birthday party that he threw with this band playing, Van Halen. Eddie Garrison spinning the hits of Fast Times at Ridgemont High here on a Monday. How are you? Jake Quarry along with Eddie and Jimmy Cook. It's Quarry and Company on 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. It's been a busy day to recap for you if you're just joining us. Where have you been? Um, Horizon League Championships getting underway tonight. The semifinals, then the finals tomorrow night. We just talked about the fact that they are going to tomorrow honor the secret game and Coach John McClendon, who basically integrated college basketball with a game that was played 80 years ago tomorrow uh, between North Carolina College and Duke University behind closed doors, and then he kind of broke down barriers when he became a coach at Cleveland State. Michael Pittman Jr. has a new deal, it would appear, for the Colts, at least agreed to in principle. He will put ink to paper that will make him sign for three additional years with Indianapolis for $70 million. $46 million of that will be guaranteed. Zaire Franklin also going to sign an extension with the Colts, a three-year deal that is believed to be worth $31 million for the defensive heart of Indianapolis. Pacers last night winning in Orlando. They are now on their way to Oklahoma City. Indiana is set to play in the Big Ten tournament as the sixth seed, awaiting the winner of Michigan and Penn State. We talked about that with Don Fisher. Of course, Purdue, lock, stock, and barrel is in the tournament, presumably as a number one seed in the big tournament, not just the Big Ten tournament. And Indiana State now, after losing to Drake, has to await their fate to find out whether or not they get an invitation. I believe they're in. Their net ranking is 29th. I think the Sycamores have done enough, and I think they are in the dance. But we will now have to wait and nervously uh, sit in anticipation on Sunday. I don't know. If there's or a selection worse, Sunday. I don't know. If there's a worse feeling for an athlete in sports outside of maybe being in the green room for the draft. I can't think of a worse spot you'd rather be though than this week, not knowing I, your future and hoping that a selection of committee members here's, gives you a here's spot. what's always driven me nuts this is a semantics and we have more news to get to in the nfl in just a second this is the semantics of selection sunday that drives me crazy okay all right they always say like indiana state they'll say and the the 12 seed in the in the south region and then it pops up and they go let's take the sycamores indiana of state? indiana state and they will take on fifth seeded Clemson, those games to be played in Birmingham or whatever. And then like five Greg seconds Gumbel. later, they showed the reaction of Indiana State. <laughs> yeah. And up above it, it says live. Well, that's not live. Clearly, that's like 30 seconds ago, right? Unless Indiana State is like watching it on a 30-second delay from everybody else. It's not live. I'll join you on the boat a little bit. Because it is 2024, and it's not just one school. It's every school, there's that delay of like five or seven right, seconds. But then it's not live. Right. I, I understand the – I'm not trying to undercut your frustration. But my point is the technology should exist where you just have nonstop live feeds of like maybe a second delay. But it's a solid – You'll still sometimes correct. hear Gubble. You see them. You see them watching correct. what you just watched. Correct. Yes. Right? Yes. So either they say to all these schools, hey, we're going to film you, but you're going to be 20 seconds behind everybody else. So it really is a live look, but but you're getting a later feed than everybody. But why would they – I mean, who would agree to that, right? No, I want to know right away. So then theoretically, by your thinking here, nothing is live, truly, if you're watching it on television. Correct. I mean, honestly, I mean, that's – no, what I'm saying is, though, <laughs> Eddie, I, I get – no, I get what Eddie's saying because, like, if you're watching a Pacer game, there is a delay between when Buddy Heal or, well, Tyrese Halliburton hits a shot and when it comes through your television. I get that. But what I'm saying mm -hmm. is they are – you are watching someone's reaction to something that the rest of the world has already right. seen. I get it. The rest of the televised world. It is not the first – when you're watching a game on television, it is the first opportunity for a television audience to see it. When you're watching the NCAA tournament unveiling, you are seeing not that maybe it's their first opportunity, but it's not the first opportunity for the masses is what I'm getting at. Now, we have breaking news to get to in the NFL. Justin Fields, the quarterback of the Chicago Bears, right? 
That is correct. The Chicago Bears have the number one pick in the NFL draft, correct? Also a fact. It is widely believed that the Chicago Bears will use that number one selection to select who, Jimmy Cook? They'll take Caleb Williams. And he plays what position? Quarterback. And that would mean that Justin Fields would be a quarterback likely to go to another team via some sort of a trade, correct? That is also correct. The team that was largely believed to be in the running for Justin Fields, partially because they play in his home state, is? The Atlanta Falcons. And the Atlanta Falcons now have, in fact, answered their quarterback needs. But they did not go with Justin Fields, the favorite son. They went. In fact, with and I'm not even going to make a joke about how in Georgia sometimes the favorite son is actually this guy's last name. Who is it going to be, Eddie? You like that? You like that? That would be Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins on his way to the Atlanta Falcons. Now the question then becomes, and I and I should probably know this. The quarterback then for the Minnesota Vikings would be who? Uh, who's the guy out of BYU they just drafted? I, do they – are the where are the Vikings drafting? 11th. That's the spot that a lot of teams have pegged J.J. J. J. McCarthy, McCarthy yeah, to go that to. That would make sense. The, I mean, that's around when he would go, one would think. The right? expert rumors are would Minnesota be willing to give up a King's Ransom to move up higher to get into the top five, to do something of that order. Uh, currently on the Vikings depth chart, it was Nick Mullins. They also had some time with Joshua Dobbs last year as well, Jaron Hall. Couple names on their depth chart that were utilized when Kirk Cousins went down. You guys like Kirk Cousins? I do, and I, I, I like Kirk Cousins the person that was opened up. I think for a lot of people, if you like, I watched the quarterback series on Netflix last year and really got opened into Kirk Cousins, Kirk Cousins' home, his life, just his day to day, and yeah, he, he seems like a good dude. So I'm happy for him that his NFL career continues. That said, I always kind of viewed him in the same vein as you would say an Alex Smith, where there's only so far that that type of quarterback can take you, but he's a good quarterback. He's an NFL starter, and he'll definitely bring stability to Atlanta. I mean, Lord knows they need it to try to evaluate with their weapons there, but he doesn't. I'm not suddenly telling you, oh, man, look out. The Falcons are now a threat in the NFC. They got better, but they're not – they can still contend for the South because of the dumpster fire that that is, even though the Buccaneers made a little bit of noise this weekend as well, retaining the services of Baker Mayfield. That is kind of a dumpster fire division. It is. I mean, first off, Carolina – so Carolina you got to buy, right? And then you've got Tampa that's trying to find footing. Atlanta's trying to find – New Orleans, you know. It was that that, yes. that that division itself was right down Who's the wire. Who's the best for all the quarterback in the NFC South? Kirk Cousins. Is it Kirk Cousins, Baker Mayfield, and then Jameis? Is he still in New Orleans? Derek Carr. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I stand by what I said at this stage of his career. We don't know, right? He would be third, probably, just based on hype alone going into next season. What division has the best quarterbacks? Would it be the South, AFC South? AFC East. Yeah. You got Tua, you've got Rodgers, Josh Healthy, Allen. and Josh Allen. Patriots are also eligible. It doesn't matter. That Those three carry enough weight. Rodgers at this point, do we know that? Gonna Is he going to be healthy? I mean, I, I hope. Look. Was there any greater publicity stunt than Aaron Rodgers? Like, you know, I, I'm back. <laughs> Come on. That guy had his he had as much chance of playing a game in the NFL in December as I did. You're not wrong. And but everyone think, knew it. But I think he will be back next year. And look, he's obviously a great player, but I mean he we don't know that he still is, if right? If you separate all his shenanigans aside and just the player himself, the league is better when he's healthy. I want to see what that looks like in New York. Is he still the upper echelon of the league? Probably not, but I think a lot of people would still give up a lot to get a year of his services, even at this stage of his career. So I would say, I would say blindly, without looking it up, I would say the AFC East. How about Mac Jones going? I mean, he was traded, but is he a solid backup? Didn't he get traded in New Orleans? Jacksonville, right? Jacksonville, that's right. I'm sorry. I couldn't remember where it was. A lot of news the last couple of days. I mean, yeah, that's, he's a fine, whatever. You know, Jacksonville, actually, that's. That, 
Boy, I, 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 I'm hesitant to say this in Indianapolis. Oh. I'm not saying it's always been the case. And you guys feel free to laugh at me here. Okay. Eddie, get the laugh track ready. Do we have a laugh track? We don't. We need one of those. We do. We and also the- need a Jake's stupid question of the day imaging. We need that. <laughs> I think with like kind of like an old timey. Stupid query? There you go. Writes itself. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? But anyway, Jaguars. I didn't mean to undercut that. I'm not saying for a lifetime. I'm not even saying up until like two years ago. I think the Jaguars are, are at least for the last couple of years, making really smart decisions and moves. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. I, I mean, Trevor Lawrence was really banged up last year. And, and I, I know I'm a Trevor Lawrence apologist, and he does make some throws that you wish he could take back if you're a Jacksonville fan. But I think he was really banged up. I don't think he was ever more than 80% healthy last year. And there were games that he probably should have sat to get right, but they, they couldn't afford it. And I think that Mac Jones is a, you know, he's 25. He's got extensive starts. He's not great, but he's not terrible. He is a perfect donut tire. You got you another. Need for, yeah. We're taking new sounder here. I was going to see which one of us went with it. You want to go? You can carry the day, Jit. You can carry the day, Eddie. Go ahead. Saquon Barkley is signing with the Philadelphia Eagles. Three years, $37.75 million. It's got to be lower than what he anticipated, right? Probably, but in terms of a situation, to have a little bit of nice cash coming in and be at a team that still views itself as a Super Bowl contender, that's not a bad landing spot. Have him and Jalen Hurts there. Um, You know, the... No, you're right about that. Philadelphia, though, I, the, the real question for Philadelphia at this point becomes, you know, how much of, and I think Sirianni's a good coach, but he's lost both coordinators, and, and they were markedly different last year at the end of the year than they were heading up to it, right? Yeah. I always get nervous to this. Todd Meyer just came in and took something off the wall and walked out, but he didn't replace it. Do, do you think that's a roster <laughs> of employees? Like, what's going on No, here? I don't think it's that. Makes think, me very nervous. I think it's a scheduling breakdown or a clock I, of some kind. He's going to go put something else up, he says. Okay. He was oh, too he quick. Did. You missed okay. it. He it was, shows you how much oh, I read. He took down the format the of the previous IndyCar race and put up the next format. Oh, how really? About that? Yeah. What, is the, what time are we going to air? Uh, hold on. This is the uh, thermal. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> to, your point about, to your point about Jacksonville, they continue to make all the right smart moves to help their biggest areas of need. And in general, with them losing Calvin Ridley, did they overpay a little bit? Probably, but you need another weapon. If one weapon is leaving, you need to replace said weapon for a quarterback like Trevor Lawrence. And they do that in Gabe Davis. Like they, they are not, there's sometimes Jake where if you're competing, whether it's in life or in sports, there's always one foe that you know is always going to make the wrong decision. Right. The Raiders are always that team, right? The Cowboys are always that team, even though I will give credit. The uh, Raiders have made some nice signings out of the gate and free agency, but there's always a team where it's like, well, they're going to self-implode. And in division for the Colts, especially at the height of like Peyton and then, you know, the high years of Andrew, you could look around the division and say, well, the Texans are going to mess up. The Jaguars are going to do something stupid. And that just hasn't been the case the last four years. Like, everybody's waiting for the Texans to be the Texans of old. The Jaguars to be the Jaguars. No, it's it's a different era. It's a different era for both of those teams to where you can no longer count on the self-destruction of your in-division foes. You have to continue to make moves to make yourself better. You can't count on their, their right. failings anymore. Yeah, I just think that they've – when you have – for any franchise, and we know this, I mean, in Indianapolis can take a page out of it, and I'm not saying they haven't, but you have to stick by it. When you draft what is finally your definitively franchise quarterback, you've there, there's two ways to do it. One is you draft a franchise quarterback and you say, we are putting in all resources for the next three years on nothing but that, right? And then the other is to have a really good core and you're like, now we just need to put like, and this is a bigger risk, a guy that is a fringe franchise quarterback and hoping that the rest of the core can lift him. You saw with Mac Jones – that they tried to do that in New England, and then it just 
once it went south, it went way south. Uh, we have the numbers on this Kirk Cousins deal. Uh, let me guess. Why are you you're, you're looking at your watch? Are you playing? Uh, because are, are you two, playing two reasons. Two reasons. One, you always make the comment about what do you have the watch? You can just see it on your phone. Well, actually, I saw it on the watch first, so I'm giving the watch its due, Jake. Okay, fair enough. Read the alert from the watch. Fair enough. Okay, how many years? Four. Kirk Cousins, a four-year deal in Atlanta, right? That is accurate. Now, the way you said that, you, you appear slightly stunned. I, 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 it's not the years; it's the value that surprises me a little bit. I'm going to say that Kirk Cousins is getting a four-year, one hundred and twenty-three million dollar contract. That would not reach mouth open territory. Four years, one hundred and eighty million dollars, a fifty million dollar signing bonus. And a hundred million dollars of that one eighty is guaranteed. Yeah, I probably would have done that. <laughs> if you were Kirk, I probably would have done that. Yeah, I would have too. When the blink t- twice in December, would you rather live in Atlanta, Minneapolis, or Buckhead? <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Man, hundred million dollars guaranteed for a thirty-five year old quarterback coming off that injury. Man. Yeah, I'd sign in a heartbeat if I was Kirk Cousins. I guess, man. Lord. That is good living. John just walked in. We'll get a couple of picks from Jimmy, and we'll hand it off next. See absolute comfort at the Flower and Patio Show, booth three. Today's plays of the day conference championship week is upon us Four plays for you on my end of the sports book. We'll scoop the five Cleveland state getting five tonight in the horizon league semifinals when they take on Oakland. So we'll scoop five with the Vikings of Cleveland state lay the five and a half on James Madison, the Sunbelt championship game as they take on the Arkansas state Red Wolves in Pensacola, Florida. Sticking with the Horizon League tournament, we'll take Northern Kentucky on the money line over Milwaukee this evening. Last one for you, San Francisco, nine-point dogs against Gonzaga in the West Coast Conference Tournament semifinals out in Las Vegas. We'll scoop the nine on San Francisco this evening. Eddie, any plays for you on the first day of championship week? No plays for Eddie, so those are your plays of the day. 
No, nah, not really. Are your trees in? No, I don't think so. I think they get in, John. I, I really don't do. think so. I think they had to win yesterday. I do. There's all this conversation. I think if they're going to get in, it's going to have to be some bullcrap committee, of which most of them I hate, except for one that I really like. But there's only one committee that I really like, and all the others I think stink. And I just uh, I don't believe they're going to get the nod on this. Too much, I think, to overcome. And it was disheartening. I was there yesterday. I got down 18, man, battled. But Drake was um, shot-making, you know what, yesterday throughout the game. They shot 61% from three. They started the, they started the second half, Jake. Uh, they were 69% from three, up 18 at the How time. How much of that was lack of defense, and how much of that was you had to tip your cap? Well, I will say this. Normally, Indiana State can't guard you. But it wasn't the lack of defense. They were just shut. DeVries was making everything. Yeah. And it was kind of like when Indiana State turned the tables and then, you know, Swope got got going. He was hitting everything, too. So, there's two think, teams that can't. I think Indiana State's in. Yeah, I just. I do, too. With all these eggheads I have to deal with, I can't imagine. All these nerds. Oh, well, look at the quad one and quad two. And, oh, yeah. So, one of the only it people- has to be a committee that's going to say, you know what? I think they would look good in there because their resume is always going to say, yeah, Look at this compared to a power conference or one of these 18 win pieces of crap all season long that they end up putting in always. So he is not God, but the fact that Lenardi has them as the top well, of the last four he in, does, really, he sucks. I mean, generally speaking, Jake, you back me up on this with the numbers. <laughs> he's, he really like teams, he's really good. He's really good. He's really good at picking the teams that go in. The fact they're at the top of his yeah, list, but that's not my. That's not the problem. The the, the problem was. You really needed to win that yesterday. And the problem is, in the Mo Valley, they have two really good teams that can match up and play well and play an exciting brand of basketball. But they normally only take one, and that's probably what they're going to do I mean, uh, Jimmy said it earlier, and he's right, John. I mean, take, for example, Indiana. If Indiana were to make a run in the NC, in, in the Big Ten tournament and get to the finals of the Big Ten tournament, you know, you got to root that for Indiana to lose if you're Indiana State because – you don't want bid stealers. I was glad Michigan State lost yesterday because where are they right now? They're on the outside. They're right a nine that. seed. I mean, hell, they missed. Are they? Which is crazy. Are they a nine seed? Yeah. Well, they beat Indiana State earlier this year, too. That's one of those quad one wins that Indiana State didn't get from all these nerds. <laughs> Who's on the committee? Who's on the NCAA committee? Are they listening over there right now, you think? No, they're holed up in a room at the JW. They're locked in. What and dorks are on that committee? They, they've We've now shifted from <laughs> the – NFL Combine being the all-top secret, <laughs> you know what I mean? To, I'm making a lot of friends over yeah. there, too. Well, they don't, yeah. they, they, don't, I, they don't listen to radio. They don't, they pay, don't? Attention, you know, they don't pay attention See, to See, I anymore. never got invited to that. You, you and Derek shit. got invited to that. I never oh, got Derek, invited. Derek went to the Fantasy Overnight Camp. I did not. So He said that that Matt Jones no, fellow talked I, the entire time. I said, what do I want to be locked up in a room for a weekend with all these nerds? Right. Well, there's I, no way. I'm in agreement with you. Eddie saw Fast Times for the first time this weekend. Did he really? Way to go, Eddie. Thank you. All right. Did you like that nudity? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> to bring back some memories? He watched it with his parents. Oh, did he really? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he probably... Blank. I'm going to forget. I better not even go there. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. John's up next. We'll be back with you tomorrow at go, noon. Eddie. Thanks for listening, everybody. The Ride, Ride. with JMV. Former Hoosier, the former Big Ten Player of the Year, Brian Evans. If he wasn't a legacy in this case,